expensive. Good morning. I'd like to call the December meeting of the Maryland State Farmers Association Executive Committee to order. To begin, I'll ask the Vice Chaplain Roth for the invocation. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you, Lord, for this day. We thank you, Lord, for this, this uh, group that is gathered here this day. We pray that you would give us wisdom and guidance and direction as we pursue the uh, events of the MSFA. We thank you, Lord, for your love to us and, and every time that you continue to bless us, continue to guide us and direct us and be with us. And we ask these things all in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Please stand for the pledge. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. I'd like to recognize President Smart from Shell for the welcome. Good morning, everybody. Appreciate you all taking the time to come down and letting us host this for you. If there's anything we can do while you're here, just get up with anybody. We've had a great staff really working hard for you all. Um, maybe we can give them a round of applause for all the things they've done setting us up. 
Again, thank you. If you need anything, just get up with us. Thank you, Dave. President Kurtz. Good morning, everyone. Welcome to Shao. And um, as Dave, as you see, Dave, he wanted to step down as president, but they twisted his arm a little bit <laughs> to, to run another term. But no, it's been a pleasure working with Dave and uh, Connie Rhodes as far as setting up this executive committee meeting today. Um, I hope everyone had uh, a good time last night. I want to thank Harford Cecil, um, the officers. I know Rob Muller, our president, is under the weather, but Vice President Joe Price. Joe, thank you. Mitch, Darlene. Uh, the reception and to Ocean City Roger please relay to the president of, of your fire department and uh, the chief and all we appreciate of allowing us at station 5 there at Kaiser Point um, of having our reception so thank you so much you want me to go into the report? vice president recognized guests for first please sir Skip, all right, Skip is Skip, what can I say? Uh, good morning. As usual, and thank goodness, we always have a large number of guests here, which aren't really guests. Most of them are members. Without them, we couldn't exist. Uh, as the past, uh, as the uh, past presidents go, we have Bob Cumberland, 80, 87, 88. We have Phil Herlock, 93, 94. Steve Cox, 96-97, Carl Eldon, uh, 99 00. Roger Stagger, 0-0-01, uh, Gene Worthington, uh, 0 -03. Terry Thompson, 0-3-0-4, Bobby Jacobs is here but didn't sign in, 0-4-0-5, uh, Paul Sterling, 0 7 8 uh, Frank Underwood, 0809. You wonder why I wear my weird clothes and stuff. They told me when I came in here, there's Frank, just do what he says and act like him. So that's, that's part of that. Uh, Doyle Cox at 1011. Dave Lewis, 1112. Mark Bilger, uh, 1718. Mike Faust, 1920. Chuck Walker, 2021, and Joel McRae, 21-22. Various committee chairmen are present. We've our past pre, uh, committee chairmen are present. We've got awards, Doyle Cox. We've got Constitution bylaws, Harv Woods. We've got uh, convention, Ron Sarnicki. We've got uh, data systems, Richard Snyder. We've got federal legislative, Bob Cumberland. We've got fire prevention and fire safety, Teresa Ann. We've got historical archives, my good buddy, Frank. Uh, we have out of state, Bob Cumberland. We have retirement and retention, Jonathan Dayton. We have scholarship, Lynn Hawkins. We have Sergeant at Arms, Laura Wood. We have by, uh, fire laws, Mike Bilger. We have volunteer trumpet, Jonathan Dayton. And we have mental wellness and health task force, Teresa. From the ladies, I am extremely fortunate. I get to sit next to them, uh, especially my, my president, Malia. 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 Before we're out, I'll get her name right, Dayton. Uh, senior Vice President, Jean Main, and a Junior Vice President, Sherry Steffens. We also have the Bessie Marshall co-chair, Teresa, with us. And under partners, what? 
Uh, okay, and uh, somebody else is here from Bessie Marshall. Where the hell is partners? Part under our partners, we've got our fire state fire marshal. Brian's here with us somewhere. Uh, we have uh, Director Mike Cox from Mifri. We have uh, Forestry uh, Chris Robinson. We have MSP uh, Flight Sergeant John Lawson. And I think I saw Doc. Yeah, I got Dr. Chisbars here. Yeah, he keeps carrying on conversations with my wife about the birds and stuff on the back porch. You know, and that. Uh, that's some, and we have our. We have our first runner-up, Fire Queen Ashley. Is with us in the back there. Pausing. If I missed you, come up and see me and sign in. Okay, so we know you were here. Thank you. President Kurtz, your report, please. Good morning. Uh, my report was electronically sent, but I'll go through uh, my highlights to the officers and members of the MSFA. Since our last executive committee meeting in August, your officers and myself, we've attended several county and regional association meetings, the Harford Cecil Memorial Service, the Shock Trauma Gala, and I had the privilege of presenting Dr. Thomas Scalala on an award on behalf of the MSFA for his 25 years of heading the R. Adams Cali Shock Trauma Center. Also, we attended the Delaware State Firefighters Association Convention in Wilmington, and we had a very large Maryland contingent, and I thank the officers and past presidents for that. We uh, attended the annual Maryland Fire Res Rescue Service Gala in Elkton, and that was attended by all three of the presidents. I also had the privilege of being in the attendance of the dedication of the Public Safety Training Center in Washington County. That was uh, in Hagerstown, and it's a very nice facility both for fire, EMS rescue, and the police in Washington County. Uh, the National Fallen F Firefighters Foundation weekend in Emmitsburg, the three presidents, we spent the weekend up there in attendance. We had a meeting with our allied partners at the MSFA office in Crofton, attended the Pennsylvania State Firefighters Association Convention in Harrisburg, uh, the fall conference of the LA MSFA in Brunswick, and the uh, Hartford County Volunteer Fire EMS Association Honor Guards Awards Luncheon. Uh, we've had many meetings with our legislative committee at 17 State Circle. Uh, I want to thank Bob and the legislative committee for all of your work, not only what you've done so far, but we're going to have a challenge this year with a new governor, lieutenant governor, comptroller, and several new delegates and state senators. It's going to be an educational process for all of us, and I'm looking forward to it. Also attended the retirement party for First Vice President Eric Smothers. Eric, for your 37 years of MSP aviation service, please stand up. Let's give Eric a round of applause. attended the dedication of the North Harford EMS station. This is the first county uh, station open in Harford County. Uh, we did a Zoom meeting with the, of the MSFA Strategic Planning Committee. Also, where's Ron? Ron, you, Ron, stand up. I happened to read in Fire Engineering that big early part of 2023, you're going to be stepping down as executive director of the now. Okay, but you'll still be for still be a consultant and so forth. But for your over 21 years, let's give Ron a, a round. It's a pleasure, Ron, 
of the MSFA working with the National Fallen Firefighters Foundation. It's been an honor and a privilege. And thank you, sir, for what all that you do. I want to thank the Vice President Smothers, Vice President Carey, Executive Director Loveless, Assistant Lynn Hawkins, officers, committee chairs, and members, all you do. Thank you, because we cannot do it ourselves. It takes all of us to do what we have to do. I want to wish you a Merry Christmas and a Happy New Year. Thank you. Thank you. First Vice President Smothers. Good morning, Mr. Chairman, and thank you. And uh, my, Ben just gave my report, so I don't really have to do a whole lot. So. You know, we, we follow in the same circle, so the same places that he was, I was, and, and Skip. I mean, uh, we've been, uh, since post-pandemic, we've been uh, traveling around to different association meetings. Of course, I've been to Washington, Frederick Counties. Uh, I was just at Southern Maryland's the other night uh, with their hospitality down there. Um, folks, you just don't realize how much this organization and the committees and the work that we do across the state how it impacts our fire and rescue and EMS folks. Um, so I don't want to dwell on what Ben just said because my report was uploaded, but I don't see it there yet. Um, but, you know, I, I think the, as Ron, or as uh, Ben had said, you know, the committee's half, the, the staff work that's done here is unparalleled. I, I can tell you that when we travel around to, West Virginia and Pennsylvania and Delaware, they're trying to figure out how Maryland's able to do what we do. They just cannot seem to understand how we are able to make our committees work, how are we are really tagged onto our legislative um, body uh, to get, get the job done. And they look to us for their help and guidance, especially with recruitment and retention. Um, that's, that's coming out, we have the mentor um, program that's about ready to get rolled out the door hopefully by the first of the year so I look forward to um, being and assisting in doing that uh, moving that forward I think that's going to help a lot of uh, programs uh, and departments across the state uh, with that it'll give you the help that uh, I think is is needed um, you know I do want to say yeah uh, I was lucky to be tagged to a, a great outfit for 37 years. Um, you know, even though Jonathan sit, sitting back there, he's still out there doing it and um, with the crews. You know, I started with a, uh, a Huey and a Bell Jet Ranger way back when, when Dr. Callie was still around. So, you know, the last ATT, Aviation Trauma Techs, for those folks that are old enough to remember what those are and was, um, I, I was the last guy of that, that realm. but. Uh, I, I feel very confident with the men and women that are out there today um, and what they do on the aircraft and knowing what they do when you call them for service, what they're capable of. Um, and that, that we have a program, and I don't say this just because I work with them, um, but we have a program that is second to none across the world that people come to see what we do. Um, and those guys are going to continue to carry, carry that on. So Jonathan, to you and the guys and gals that are still doing it, be safe out there uh, in your day-to-day -day duties. Um, I appreciate the partners and folks that helped me along the way um, uh, here through, through my career. So as time rolls on, uh, I was just appointed as the uh, uh, chairman for SEMSAC for the next two years, so um, they don't kick me to the curb too far. So, um, you know, one more chair to, to go, so I'm very proud to continue to represent us here in Maryland. Um, but I just want to say thank you very much. Uh, wherever you go through your travels through the rest of the holidays, be careful, be safe. Um, Happy New Year, uh, and thank you. Thank you. Second Vice President Kerry. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. As Eric and said, I follow pretty much along their trail uh, going with them. Uh, since their Jarrettsville meeting, I've traveled over 6,000 miles. As some of you have learned today coming down here, 
from your places. It's a long ride, but it's a pretty ride, as we say, you know, at that. Uh, been to most all of the places that uh, Ben and Eric have said. A couple of uh, different ones. We did have a potential line of duty death of a fire chief in uh, Stockton in Worcester County uh, prior to the uh, prior to your fall convention, and uh, was involved in that and his funeral and everything. That's not. I don't think it's been ruled yay or nay yet, but there had the privilege of. Uh, attending Salisbury Fire Department's 150th anniversary, Snow Hill's 125th anniversary, and representing our association and presenting them with plaques and things. We travel a lot, and it's interesting that no matter what part of the state we're in, the same problems exist. The only thing that changes there's a date on the calendar and a patch on the shoulder. But as, as there's a Skip Carey in Ocean City Fire Department, there's somebody just like him in all the rest of the fire departments. Or, the, be quiet, Roger. <laughs> or, or Roger Stagger. But interesting, and I think the main thing I'd like to do is uh, provide a sense of humor for my compatriots sitting up there at the front table. But uh, I'd like to thank all of you. You know, I started this uh, trip, and I could not make it without your help and support. And every one of you have been like that. A year ago this time, down the uh, road in Berlin, I announced that I was running for second vice president. And uh, we had a campaign, and it was successful. Through your help, your advice, that. I'd like to announce today, since it's a bit of a year, that I intend on being a candidate for Eric's spot in June, and I'm looking forward to the same degree of help, advice, and support you gave me last June, this June. It's a pleasure, and it is the most enjoyable thing that I've had in a while to do it. So, thank you. Thank you. Executive Director Loveless, do you have anything for her? You don't have a 30 minute speech or anything? <laughs> Secretary Doyle Cox. Good morning. Yeah, we'll get. Yeah, I do. I sound real good. But anyway, uh, my report's been uh, filed electronically. And just a couple of things is one. Um, today on your one of your action items will be the approval of the August the 20th and 21st uh, executive committee meeting uh, minutes. Um, everybody should have them. Other thing is, um, you know, we're moving into an area of uh, recognition. We need to start to recognizing uh, individuals for what they have done. Also, we uh, need to uh, start recognizing the uh, companies that have, uh, as uh, uh, Vi Vice President uh, Kerry indicated, he was at um, Salisbury's 150th anniversary. We're we're running into where there's quite a few of these 100, 125, 150, and so on. Uh, um, they're celebrating their uh, anniversaries. So if you hear of any, please let me know because we get the appropriate uh, certificate or plaque out to them. Um, at the last uh, executive committee meeting, we uh, passed out the directories. Yes, there are some mistakes in there. But I haven't heard that many uh, comments on them. So if the, it go through it, if you find mistakes, not only yours, but anyone else's, wrong phone number, or wrong address, or whatever, let me know so we can get it uh, corrected as uh, time goes. Uh, with that, Mr. Uh, 
Chairman, any questions? Any questions of the Secretary? If not, I'll entertain a motion to approve the August 20th, 21st Executive Committee minutes. Ron Block and Doug Simpkins. Any questions? Any discussion on the motion? All in favor say aye. aye. Any opposed, no. Unanimous. Thank, Thank you. you, Mr. Chairman. Chaplain, Chaplain Long. Good morning. Uh, usually I come up here and say not much is going on, but I have a lot to say today. Uh, I've submitted articles, and I'm only saying this because Doug has been on my case. I've submitted articles to the Trumpet about having companies submit their members for the memorial page. And attached to my report is a list of all of the members who have, I have known of that have died in the state of Maryland. The ones highlighted in yellow are the ones that were posted on Facebook and have not, the companies have not submitted their memorial pages for those folks. So please go back to your organiz when you go back to your county meetings and stuff, remind folks to submit their memorials for their members. <laughs> Since the last meeting, I was honored to represent the Federation of Fire Chaplains at the CFSI Executive Committee meeting in Washington, D.C. I also attended the Federation of Fire Chaplains Conference in Atlanta, Georgia. And we learned that the public safety health, public safety officers' health in Georgia is so important that the governor submitted a bill, HB 703, that created the Office of Public Safety Support. Uh, it came along with $1.5 million in funding. Uh, their full total staffing will be 50 people, made up of firefighters, police officers, and clinicians. And he believes that you can't take care of Public safety officers can't take care of the public if they're not taking care of themselves. So since we have this committee stood up, I think we, this is one thing we can look at. And I already talked to Teresa that we need to have them come up here and talk to us. Maybe that's the route we can go in the state of Maryland if we can get the gov governor's support. Uh, we also learned at the conference that um, Maryland is number three in human trafficking. The, the U.S. Department of uh, Homeland Security has records and shows that there's more people held in captivity now than there was before the Civil War and slavery. It's not a very good thing here. Uh, also, I was honored to attend the uh, National Vol uh, Volunteer Fire Council meeting in Wilmington, North Carolina with Dave Lewis. And we're, the National Volunteer Fire Council rolled out the new contract they have with the Provident Insurance. Folks, I know there's a lot of counties in the state of Maryland that do not have uh, employee assistance programs. For nine bucks, this new policy that Provident has, has comes with an employee assistance program. So please, please, it's a shame that only 680 people in Maryland belong to the National Volunteer Fire Council. For nine bucks, it comes with, not, and it's not only for you, if your household can take advantage of this employee assistance program. So please encourage your members just to spend that $9 a year to be a member of this. It's not only, not only the EAP program, but also has other benefits as well. I have some books on the table. If anybody's interested, come look at them. They're free, take what you want. And last night I learned that uh, Margaret Gowdy is in North Carolina. She's not doing too good. If you want to send her a card, I have her address over at the table. That's all, that's my report. Any questions to the chaplain? Thank you. Ladies President, President Dalton. I'm green now. Hi, everybody. Glad to see you all. Um, before I start, Skip is right. You never know what you're going to see when he comes into our meetings. <laughs> but a lot of people enjoy that. 
I have with me today is Senior Jean Main, Junior um, Vice President Sherry Steffen, Recording Secretary, yeah, yeah, Recording Secretary Joan Kramer, Financial Secretary Holly Trago, Chaplain Kay Trago, Historian Samantha Butterfield, um, our past uh, presidents is Sandy Lutz, 2010-2011, Welcome. Um, Teresa Christman, 2011-2012. Welcome. And Lori Dembo, 2019 and 2020. You're welcome. Um, Teresa and Lori are our Bessie Marshall, so go back there and buy tickets. Um, I also have um, Ashley Paulson, which is our fire prevention queen. Um, I enjoy working with everybody, and if you guys, uh, Ben, need us for anything, just give us a holler. We're uh, always around here for you. Well, happy thank or Christmas, not Thanksgiving, Christmas and New Year. <laughs> we'll see you all later. Thank you. Thank you. Senior Vice President or Junior Vice President, do you have anything? No. Oh, she has laryngitis. She can't talk. Okay. <laughs> but we'll have Sherry try something. <laughs> Put you on the spot. That's okay. I'm ready this time. Last time they said we need to talk, so I'm going to talk. One of my position as being, one of my things as being the junior vice president is membership. So if any of you out there know any auxiliaries that want to join, reach out to me, and I'll reach out to them. We did get one at Fall Conference, Washington County. They joined, so if you know anybody, just let me know. Thank you. Thank you. Bessie Marshall, Laurie, and Teresa. Do you want to have the fire prevention queen too? Sure. They're next. Okay. Go ahead, Ashley. Is it on? It's on. Good morning, everyone. Thank you for allowing me the opportunity to be here. I have had a great second quarter. I was able to attend 22 different events, meetings, seminars, and competitions. I look forward to the rest of this year and what the new year will bring. If you have any questions or need, want me to come to any events, feel free to reach out. My email is on the MSFA website, and I have business cards at the back. Um, I like to leave a fire prevention tip everywhere I go. And this year, or for this meeting, my fire prevention tip is to remember to water your Christmas trees. And when you're picking them out, make sure when you touch them, the needles aren't falling off because that's a sign that they're already dehydrated and it increases your risk of fire. Thank you. Thank you. I hope everyone took note of that fire prevention message and that we practice fire prevention safety. We also have safety. tip sheets in the back with that information. Thank you. Bessie Marshall. Go ahead. Okay. Flip okay. a coin. Okay. All right. Oh, yes. Yes. Okay, so my report was filed. Um, so far, uh, we've given out $16,320 in claims. Uh, Calvert has one case, Carroll two, Cecil two, Baltimore County two, Frederick two, Prince George's County one, St. Mary's County three, Washington County two, and Wicomico County one. I did have to return one application and they have to submit it back to me. Uh, this information was not done properly and it was something that I couldn't correct on the phone. It's something that the department had to deal with. So I'm just waiting for that. So it'll be a 17th case when it's coming. Now, okay, so you heard her report. So as of September 30th, when we had our financial um, audit, our income was $2,141. And at that point, our expenses were $9,736. Our return rate for the fire companies is 16%. That's either buying, selling, 
um, or if they sent in a $50 donation or whatever instead of buying the tickets. That's fine. I counted that as their donation. So um, that's 58 out of 349 companies that sent back something. Um, the auxiliary returns is 33%, and I have 50 auxiliaries out of 150. 150 auxiliaries. So you see where that's not, not really good. Um, and for the auxiliaries, they didn't buy all 10. Maybe some bought three or more. Um, let's, let's go back and think about this for a minute. Has anyone in your company or county received benefits from this fund? And if so, please go back to your associations, companies, and encourage them to try and sell the tickets or purchase or send them back um, with one of you. Um, just think of it this way, it's Christmas time or whatever holiday you celebrate and give it as a Christmas gift. I know your wives or husbands would, would love one for an anniversary gift, you know, so let's try it that way. If we really need to get our income up, even with our fall conference totals with the income from the beginning of the year was only $8,810 and with the $16,000 that's we're really falling behind. So. We're trying to do our part. Um, I even got a nasty gram um, from one person telling me that uh, maybe I should send them out earlier. I got his note in the end of November and the executive committee was given these tickets um, August 20th. So it, it kind of looks bad on me and I don't like things to look bad on me. <laughs> Um, I have a breakdown if any of the executive committee members would like to see the breakdown of their counties because I have quite a few that have zero that have turned any in. So I, I would really appreciate it. I mean, we are giving up to $1,020 for each case. And without the support of the fire companies and the auxiliaries, this fund is going to go belly up. So um, our, like, Teresa said, we have nice raffle, this right? raffle, a dollar, please support us. We have Bessie Marshall pins, five dollars. We have a basket back there that is filled with Maryland flag. Uh, it's a Maryland flag basket raffle with a lot of Maryland stuff in it. And we also have raffle tickets here today, five dollars each. Come and get your raffle tickets. We're located in the back at the circle. Laurie, Thank can you. you walk over here for just a second? Oh God, I didn't think I could. You can walk up front. For the Christmas season, I'll make a donation to Bessie Marshall, and I'll challenge anyone in the room to make a donation of your choice to Bessie Marshall. Thank you all. Any questions to Bessie Marshall? Hey, thank you. Trustees, Chairman Alexander. Good morning, everyone. Do you all have my report on your computers? If you do, you're doing real good because I didn't send one. <laughs> uh, the long and, short and the secretary was typing that as you said it. <laughs> uh, I didn't send one in due to the fact I had nothing to report at the deadline time, but I just have one or two items here today. Uh, the updates to the trustees manual were put in back in July. Uh, I missed the uh, August meeting, so I wasn't able to report, but our trustees, updated trustees manual is online. Um, we've had no feedback on the appeals board personnel. Uh, we have only one claim pending right now, and that's for, from the Stockton VFD for the passing of uh, Chief uh, Payne down there. We're waiting on some information, some further information to, to make sure we do the right thing there. And, and this is for all the, the executive committee and, and quite frankly for everybody in the room. 
please note that the MSFA trustee benefits are not attached to or referenced by any other benefits such as the National Fallen Firefighters, PSOB, Maryland Fire Service Memorial, State of Maryland, or Workers' Comp. The trustees are established and bound by state law, Article 7-201 through 7-203. Our procedural manual is on the MSFA website. Go to committees, punch board of trustees, come down the page on the left-hand side about three-quarters of the way down. There's a place where you can uh, uh, download the uh, procedural manual. Procedural manual is on the MSFA website and provides all the avenues, documents, requirements, and time parameters for filing a claim for benefits. Uh, like I say, you can save yourself a whole lot of uh, worry when you hear from one of your departments wanting to know what to do, send them there first, let them get a read, and then and if they have questions, certainly they can contact one of us, and we'll be glad to help them out with anything else. Any questions on anything for the trustees? Any Thank questions? You. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you for that clarification. I'm sorry? Sure. Okay. Okay. Can you go to the mic so it? He's got it. Well, oh, I was going to say um, she's at Towson. Uh, she's in the band, and they had performance today. And then she has something for school tonight, so that's why she couldn't be here. Okay. Thank you. First of all, I'd like to apologize for not being able to be there in person today to get my report. I have two concerts I'll be performing on this weekend at my college, the first being with our orchestra and the second being with our symphonic band. I also want to let everyone know that while I haven't been able to be as active as I would have liked to have in the past couple of months with fire prevention, I have been staying active on my Instagram and Facebook accounts, so if you're not already, please go ahead and follow them. Um, if you just search MSFA Miss Fire Prevention 2022, they should come up. Um, as I move into the into winter break, which for me is the entire month of January, as well as the spring semester, I'll be a lot more available. So please feel free to invite Ashley and I to anything that you have, whether it be a community event or an event with your fire company. My email is clittle2 at msfa.org, and my phone number, which you can call or text me on, is 443-207-0447. Um, as we're going into this holiday season, there's a couple fire safety tips we should remember. The first being that you should water your tree daily if you have a live tree, because a dry tree is a fire hazard. You should also remember that any electronic decorations that you're using should be UL or another third party certified, and you should only be using them for the use they're rated for, such as not using indoor string lights outdoors. You should also be inspecting the cords regularly for damage, such as true marks or fraying, and you should make sure that cords are kept in a place where pets or younger children can't get to them and chew on them. There's also a lot of, you should also remember basic kitchen safety tips, like not keeping pot holders or oven mitts along the back of the stove, tying up loose hair, not wearing loose clothing, no loose jewelry. Um, and keeping pets and children out of the kitchen while you're cooking so it's distraction free. Thank you guys so much for your support this year, and I hope that you all have a happy, safe, and healthy holiday season. Have a great rest of your day. Okay, attorney Mike Barlow. Good morning, everybody. Uh, one thing of note uh, for this morning, it's getting close to time for a trademark renewal. Uh, so we'll be getting some paperwork together on that. Uh, it's not due until after the beginning of the next fiscal year, I believe. So we shouldn't be asking for any money. Uh, in all likelihood, we shouldn't be asking for any money for the renewal prior to that. Uh, but just in case, I'll let the budget uh, committee know that, uh, that we may be talking to them. But I've asked them a few years to set some money aside, so they've known that this is going to be coming. Uh, and there may be some documentation that we need to get, but it's a, 
a fairly straightforward process. Um, other than that, on a personal note, as many of you know, I uh, had applied to become a judge here in Worcester County. Uh, someone else was appointed to that, but, uh, but I did have a nice chat with the governor and, and just barely missed it. And I had a ton of support from people here that was really humbling. And, and I thank everybody that made calls and sent letters on, on my behalf for that. It was, uh, it was very well received. So thank you. Uh, one of the things that I did talk with the governor about was my service with the MSFA. So the letters that you all sent certainly had an effect. Um, the other thing that I have, which is also of a personal note, is uh, that my littlest baby is turning two years old today or has turned two years old today. Uh, so I probably won't be here very long. I'm going to cut out around lunchtime. So if anybody has any questions for me, uh, please catch up with me before I leave. Any questions? Thank no you. questions? Thank you. Thank you. Parliamentarian, come to the mic. Come to the mic, Mr. Parliamentary. <laughs> I'm glad you all have a liberal schedule today and can afford this extra time, Mr. Chairman. <laughs> It's okay. Okay, time's up. <laughs> Thank you very much. <laughs> and you would have done the same thing to me. <laughs> In a heartbeat. Moving to our partners, we're going to start with the State Fire Marshal's Office, Fire Marshal Gracie. Well, I don't think I've ever gone first. <laughs> Special. I like it. Uh, uh, everybody should have my report. Uh, there are some changes because things happened this week. Uh, right now, we're currently at a uh, total of 55 fire deaths throughout the state. Um, and we currently have five deaths pending with the uh, Office of the Chief Metal uh, Examiner. So um, I'm hoping to keep the numbers down. Um, if we can for December, hopefully we'll have a, a mild December and we won't have too many more uh, fatalities. But uh, keep, uh, keep having your departments get those messages out there. And if you can get out there in the communities, talk to folks, take those advantages of doing that, to keep the numbers down. Uh, you see our third quarter numbers there for uh, the office. Uh, 196 investigations, 138 of those were fire related, 47 explosives, and 11 others. Uh, we had two cases closed by arrest, eight individuals arrested, 2,800 inspections, and about 1,225 plans reviewed. Uh, there is a change to the emphers in your report. I have an update with regards to that. The uh, following departments are still delinquent for FY22. Uh, Charles County, it's uh, Namajoy and Bryant's Road. They owe us the uh, first six months, January through June. Somerset County, Mount Vernon, May and June. Wacomico, Willards, January through June. And Powellville, June. Worcester, Ocean City, June. And then BWI Airport. So. You can talk to those companies, and if we can get those reports in, obviously that is holding up their 508 money. So uh, if they don't need it, I'll be more than happy to take it. So, uh, you know, I mean, it's like, it seems to be a common theme today that everybody's not turning stuff in or not doing something. So I don't understand it, but it's in the law. <laughs> uh, we had a great fire prevention week. We uh, attended numerous open houses. Obviously, uh, the great partnership we have with Delmarva Power again here on the shore. As you know, we took over all the uh, bomb squad operations in Baltimore City as of July 1st. So we've been dealing with a lot of uh, mostly the events that we've had to cover. So uh, Fleet Week and all the games and everything is kind of slowing down a little bit. But uh, haven't run too many calls into the city. But 
obviously the activities that occur up there have kept us quite busy. Another asset for us is the U.S. Bomb Technician Association Technology and Training Center down in Indian Head. They opened up uh, a few months ago. We were down there uh, with the governor uh, to open up that facility. And it's, again, just another uh, another asset for us for, on the bomb squad side of the house. Uh, K-9 Sky and Sandy were in Evansburg, along with myself, for the U.S. Fire Administrator, Summit of Fire Prevention Control. Uh, the summit touched on major issues in today's fire service. It really was a good day. Uh, to be in there and partner with all the other associations throughout the, the country and deal with, uh, deal with the problems that we see each and every day in the fire service and have together, us come together as a national group of individuals uh, to try to work on those problems. So I'll address any questions if anybody has it. Any questions? Do you have anything from the fire Okay. Uh, Mark's, Mark, coming up. Mark. Mark's coming up for that. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Commissioner Belger from the State Fire Prevention Commission. I'd also like to recognize Commissioner Faust and Commissioner Alexander who are in attendance here today also. The commission continues to work on uh, adoption of a new state fire code. It was recently sent to state police for some final review and there was some question about a financial impact or economic impact with the passing of the new legislation. So they have decided to make it a emergency legislation and basically my understanding is that they have sent that out yesterday as emergency legislation. So, but I have not been told, I don't think the fire marshal has been told when it will actually go into effect um, that we can then move the next step of producing the fire laws book at this time. Questions? Any questions? Yes, sir. Is that holding up our it's holding up our book. It's holding up the the uh, building, the uh, the state building code, and several other things that are. Uh, again, they're just waiting. Other state agencies that interact with the fire marshal's office. It's holding up some of the stuff that they've been trying to do. But there's been, uh, I guess, for whatever reason, uh, state police have had it now for at least a month or more several months reviewing it after the commission approved it and voted to adopt it. Uh, so again, as of yesterday, I got an email that it has been released as emergency legislation, which our understanding is that it doesn't have to go through any other hoops, but they did send it back for legal review, at least according to the email, it was going back for legal review. Any other questions? Thank you. Thank you. Maryland Aviation Command. Good morning, everybody. Good morning. I'm John Lars. I'm a first sergeant in the Aviation Command. I oversee uh, helicopter operations over here on the eastern, on the eastern shore, Trooper Four and Trooper Six. So. I don't want to kill too many trees for my 25-page report I'm about to read here, so I'm just kidding. Um, first of all, Eric Smothers, thank you. Thank you for your service to the state of Maryland and everything that you do, okay? You uh, trailblaze the way for people like myself and uh, others, okay? State um, owes you a big, big thank you. So let me start off with uh, personnel. Um, Aviation Command uh, just had six trooper medics complete um, its uh, in-dock training and have been cleared and have been cut loose and are covering shifts throughout the uh, state of Maryland. Currently, four rescue technicians completed their um, upgrade to crew chief as a lead flight paramedic on the helicopter. So that is a, that is a major feat in itself. Um, very stressful. Uh, five trooper medics who graduated the last two academy classes are completing their um, law enforcement field training at barracks and will be transferred into the Aviation Command 
January of 2023, and then they'll begin their pipeline as far as their in-dock training and the Aviation Command. So they should be spooled up flying on the aircraft in uh, late, late winter, early spring. Um, pilots. We currently have two new Pilot 1As who are currently doing their, uh, their SIT training, section integration training at the Easton section, Trooper 6, and the Washington section, Trooper 2. Um, there are currently 17 helicopter pilot vacancies in the Aviation Command throughout the state. So we are uh, constantly, constantly, constantly recruiting good personnel. We never stop. We're currently recruiting pilot 1As, pilot 2s, maintenance personnel to work on the helicopters, make sure that they stay in the air, keeping us safe, making sure that I go home to my family okay, each and every day that I climb on board that aircraft. Uh, procurement manager and instructor pilot. Aircraft maintenance, we currently have two aircraft in their annual heavy inspections. One is being conducted in-house and that's uh, 387 Mike Delta and 389 Mike Delta is uh, being conducted at Augusta in Philadelphia. Are you kidding me? <laughs> I'm just gonna I'm just gonna press forward. I'll talk a little bit louder. So, I would I would just wait. <laughs> yeah. Jonathan is just your personality, buddy. So. I try, Eric. <laughs> All right. Fantastic. Uh, ongoing projects. Um, something very exciting. Uh, and thank you, Eric Smothers. You apparently know the right people and know who to uh, talk to. Um, whole blood program. Okay, there are a lot of a lot of people who have been very, you know, it, it's been a very long process. Okay, to to get this blood program going, um, there was a successful planning meeting with many partners in October. Um, the proposed operational plan and updated contract will be distribu distributed in the next few weeks. The plan is for us to start carrying blood at two sections in early 2023. So we, that, that right there is a game changer for every trauma patient okay, and citizen in the state of Maryland okay, who needs blood getting to definitive care. Uh, the hoist platform at Martin State Airport, the uh, frame and, and fabricated simulated helicopter cabin have been completed for the platform. The search for a spare hoist is currently underway to be able to install on the platform and the project is moving forward. Uh, we are also moving ahead with a project to acquire a Westcam simulator. The training simulator will allow crews to practice using the helicopter's camera system and completing operational scenarios without impacting the fleet by adding additional blade time to the airframes. Unmanned aircraft systems, UAS, also known as drones, we refer to them as UAS, I think it's a little bit more palatable. I think people get a little bit scared when they hear the uh, verbiage drone. Um, the Avi A Aviation Command continues with the development of its UAS program. Uh, currently we have 10 Altel Evo 2 dual UASs. The command has certified more than 20 sworn troopers in FAA Part 107 requirements. These units have been deployed throughout the state of Maryland and they are supporting our search and rescue missions. Let me be clear that they are not replacing the AW-139 or search and rescue. However, it is an additional resource for um, personnel on the ground uh, in instances where weather, uh, terrain, foliage, and search times uh, have an impact. Uh, we can call out the UAS uh, for additional support. Uh, missions, I'm not going to go through all the, uh, all the uh, data on here. Um, everything here was submitted uh, but I will just hit the uh, highlights for 20 as of December 1st 
2022, um, the total missions that the Aviation Command has flown is 2,760. Total flight hours across the board with the uh, fleet of 10 air, airframes is uh, 2,121.4 hours of flight time. Notable, notable events, we continue to uh, um, conduct uh, statewide um, search and rescue and hoist missions. Uh, there, there's several on here. I'm not going to read through them, but there's definitely a running theme with hunters falling out of tree stands. Uh, so all of us over here on the eastern shore, uh, actually, this is hot off the uh, press. Um, yesterday, Trooper 6 conducted a hoist in the Blackwater Refuge in lower Dorchester County. So kudos to um, Cambridge and to Dorchester County EMS getting on scene assessing quickly making the request for us Trooper 6 launched out of Easton they got rigged and ready for the uh, hoist determined that it was the only way to get the hunter who fell 14 feet and was paralyzed from the waist down okay got him out and they flew him up to our Adams Cali shock trauma in uh, Baltimore so CISCOM and the Operational Control Center. Uh, in early October, uh, there was a much needed upgrade to our um, helicopter dispatch. Uh, it's called Flight Vector. That's, what, that's our internal CAD system that's used at uh, CISCOM um, and throughout the uh, state. Uh, Flight Vector version 6.8.1.5 has been installed and it's on the state servers. and. Um, we could not have done that without the uh, partnership, okay, that we have with uh, MIMS down there. So, are there any questions for me? Yes, sir. One. Yes. Can, can you turn your mic on so it can be recorded? <laughs> there you go. So that there are. Um, I do know that Dr. Flo Care, Sergeant Josh Hines, and many others um, have traveled the uh, country. I, I, I believe one of the programs that we have tried to model, um, Eric, maybe you could help me out here. Okay, uh, Houston. Yeah, H Houston, Houston was uh, one of the first ones that rolled, rolled it out, and now some of their ancillary medic units. So uh, I'm going to guess that once aviation starts that some of the other jurisdictions will try to pick that up um, but we're going to go through the process they have crisscrossed the country Loudoun County Virginia uses it um, so we have neighboring folks Fairfax uh, some of the other air operators are using it and I, it, it's going to be a game changer for us here yes. um, and it's whole blood it, what it does is it's using the whole components it's not just properties just pack cells and so forth so it's actually better the trauma center is using it um, and it's it's costly but at the end of the day it's going to benefit Marylanders here uh, statewide so um, it's in process as Jonathan was saying there has been some hiccups logistically internally but we're working through those We've moved, moved that ball. We've kicked that can down the road. So he's right. Hopefully after the first of the year, um, you know, we talk, spoke to the right people uh, to move it forward. So it will be a game changer. Chip. Thank you. Uh, several years ago when we were developing the statewide communication system and statewide CAD, there was discussion, and Robert, you probably remember this, of also uh, integrating the flight vector Mm -hmm. so that all the communication systems would be able to, or at least the barracks, would be able to determine the status of, of, of the uh, troopers throughout the state. Is that also going to happen uh, to integrate that into the statewide CAD or to the communication centers as it's developed? Do you know? So, so I don't have an answer for you. However, I can find out and I can absolutely get that, um, get that clarification for you. Um, I don't oversee uh, the Operational Control Center and, and uh, CISCOM, uh, but I can absolutely find out that information and, and get it to you. Sure. Absolutely. Absolutely. Any other questions? Steve, I just got over here. 
you know, uh, Jonathan was talking about the 17 vacancies because I, I saw that raise a bunch of eyebrows. So some of those folks are like me, just uh, retired. But, um, you know, the military is now going to start using the AW-139s. So, you know, a lot of those guys that we may have gotten may stay where they're, they're at. So we try to attract some of those folks. And uh, sometimes it's difficult to recruit folks when, you know, Uncle Sam might be offering something a little bit more. So, you know, they've got their work cut out for them, but I, I know that um, they're diligently working to try to fill those slots. So we are. We're, we're, we're competing we're, we're, with everybody else. Absolutely. And the one thing that is very difficult to compete with is the almighty dollar. Okay. Um, Commercial. What, the men and women that we have, okay, in front of the aircraft who pilot these um, are some of the most talented aviators throughout the country, throughout the world. We have pilots from overseas who, who come over and, and fly these aircraft. Okay, it's a dream job, it truly is. However, it would be nice if it paid like a dream job. <laughs> um, um, it, hands down, the program itself that Marylanders are afforded, okay, and it, 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 it is, it, it truly is a first class top rated outfit and we cannot do it without your support the partnerships that we have with the maryland firemen's association and shock trauma okay mims you know, it, it, it is we, we truly have something special okay something that marylanders should be very very proud of okay and it's every person in this room um, you know, those who are before, those who will come after us, you know, we're certainly doing the right thing for Maryland here, okay? And we need to continue, you know, pressing forward, okay, being the tip of the spear, okay? Blood on the aircraft, okay? Eric has said it, I've said it, it's a game changer, and it's long overdue, and this is going to serve everybody, okay, very, very well. Is, is it costly? Sure. But it's also the cost of doing business and saving lives, and we can't put a price tag on that. So, anything else for me? Any other questions? Sergeant, thank you. Yes, sir. Thank you very much. Shock trauma? Anyone? I didn't see Becky. Okay. Uh, EMS board, MIMS, Dr. Chismar. There. Good morning. My report is the same as the parliamentarians. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Your time's up. <laughs> Beautiful. <laughs> Go ahead. All right. Thank you. Um, well, good morning, everyone. On behalf of MIMS, uh, Dr. Dalbridge and our EMS board chair, uh, Clay Stamp, um, really want to thank uh, the MSFA and all of uh, your membership for your commitment to patient care. I know things have been very tough um, recently with loss of personnel, both to illness and retirement and so forth. So I uh, really look forward to l working with Chairman, uh, SEMSEC Chairman Smothers, and of course, President Kurtz. It feels like I'm back at home, even though I traveled two and a half hours. I have uh, quite the Hartford County crowd here today. So without further ado, we're keeping our eye on the radar as far as the infectious diseases um, go. Um, these are all listed out and our report was filed electronically. but. Uh, COVID is not over. Uh, we're certainly keeping our eye on that. We urge people to maintain vigilance with masking during patient care. In addition to COVID, we also have uh, monkeypox out there, which has been less of a concern for us, thankfully, um, and also RSV and influenza. I think over the past week, we've seen our influenza uh, flu A activity particularly just spike up um, recently. So um, time to be vigilant for sure. Uh, not to remain closed and indoors, but to be vigilant out there. Uh, Dr. Delbridge and I have been crisscrossing the state. Um, we've visited with almost every hospital ED to discuss the rollout of our new alert system, which will be called EDAS, Emergency Department Advisory System. This will use a real-time feed from CRISP, which is the Health Information Exchange, to let us know the number of patients that are physically present in the emergency department of any given hospital in the state. Um, and what we're also discussing what the capacity of the hospital emergency departments are at, at the time that we're visiting with them. So we're meeting with the chairman uh, and leadership of every ED. Uh, prior to this rollout, we anticipate, again, depending on crisp time schedule, being able to roll this out 
in early 2023. When we do roll out the new ED alert system, the, essentially what the field clinicians will see is a rating of how busy the hospital is on a scale of one through four. Um, right now with the current system, the yellow and red alert really has started to lose, has lost its meaning probably long ago. So the yellow and red alert color system, um, that part of the color system will go away. It'll be replaced with a numerical value um, that will, will require no manual data entry from the hospital whatsoever. It'll be picked up automatically. So we're looking forward to that. Uh, we will keep in place the reroute and the mini disaster components uh, of the alert system. So those two colors will, will remain, but the others will go away. And I'm happy to take any questions on that um, at the end. The other big area I want to highlight uh, is the C4, the Critical Care Coordination Center, and the C4 for pediatrics. I know Cindy uh, will be able to update you more on the pediatric end, but just from a C4 as a whole, we've taken about 4,200 calls since the inception. And um, we've been able to place patients or help hospitals manage those patients in place um, in, in a lot of cases so that the patient has not had to be transferred um, long distances. So we'll continue to do that. Um, we are funded externally to do that through at least June of this year. And we'll continue to do that as long as we can uh, maintain funding for that. The other big benefit um, that we're really excited about is we continue to work with the, the Department of Health on increasing supplemental payments to jurisdictions. Last year in fiscal 22, we had 13 EMS operational programs uh, participate in the Medicaid program. I believe one of the largest jurisdictions uh, stood to gain about 30 or $40 million in increased uh, reimbursement from Medicaid. After the first of the year, in addition to that supplemental payment program, Medicaid will start also paying for treatment on scene without transport, transport to alternative destinations, and they will start paying for mobile integrated health visits. We have about 11 counties statewide that have mobile integrated health programs that are funded through the generosity of their hospitals or grants um, and, and have not been funded by the payers in the past. So even though the price tag is small, around $150 per visit, we're optimistic that that sets a good precedent in the sense that we're being reimbursed appropriately for the work, or not appropriately, but we're re being reimbursed some, I should say, for the work that we're doing. Uh, and the last two things I'll mention is we continue work with the Crisis Scene Collaboration Work Group. And what that is focused on is the management of the agitated patient or the patient with agitation. Um, so we've been working with our law enforcement colleagues and state police, um, as well as the municipal agencies, uh, particularly Travis Nelson, to try to come up with some agreement as to how to best de-escalate the agitated patient. Um, we'll also be working with uh, Director Cox and Director Cox at MIFRI um, on further uh, ensuring that we, uh, uh, that we, we get the, the word out around de-escalation and trying to de-escalate patients and not going right to physical restraint if possible or uh, chemical sedation. As all of you know, we, on the chemical sedation front, we have uh, fought to maintain uh, all the appropriate medications in the formulary. Uh, there were two cases out of Colorado that threatened that. Uh, legislature had a lot of questions and wanted to know um, I think the question we had was, we don't use ket ketamine in Maryland, do we? Um, we? We said, of course we do, um, but we use it appropriately and judiciously, and our clinicians are all spooled up to make sure that the monitoring is in place after it's given. Um, we, are, we have a report that's due to the legislature this year and the next three years um, after that to detail the use of ketamine. Uh, so that report's just been filed with the legislature. And then the last thing I'll mention is we're very excited to have our usual conference schedule again. Um, back in, and the dates are in the electronic report. So February we'll hold the Winterfest or we'll work with the Winterfest committee on the Winterfest conference in Easton, uh, Miltonberger in March, and then EMS care down here in Ocean City at the end of April. So it'll be great to see everybody and get those conferences, educational conferences back up and off the ground. Hopefully I've not been too long winded. Take any questions you have. Any questions for Dr. Chismark? Thank you. Cool. Thank you. Mifri, Director Cox, Deputy Director Marlet. Morning, Mr. Chairman.
Okay, I uh, filed a report electronically. Uh, just to hit the highlights, I won't read through the whole thing for you. But uh, first, I want to start out with the annual report from MIFRI's available on the website. So, uh, provided uh, training to more than 24,000 students uh, this year. It ended up being about 17,300 emergency services, uh, different uh, programs, and about uh, more than 650,000 student uh, hours. So. Um, I want to start off also with the <clears throat> EMT in the report. There's a uh, table with all the EMT stuff. As I said at the last meeting, I think we're over that hurdle and the debacle now. Um, when you are looking at uh, the classes from FY22 and as well as uh, 21 and on back, you can see a steady uh, progression of success as we go forward. If you back out the, when you're looking at the stats, if you back out the six high school national registry programs is an 85 percent pass rate for the uh, emt programs in ours that exceeds the state average of uh, 71 and national registry average of 70 uh, percent so we're doing uh, very well in that area um, i would like to mention though there was uh, the emr program had switched out we went away from the old uh, brady program with that as we did earlier with the emt program and that has an 80% uh, pass rate first attempt uh, for the folks in the EMR. So uh, they're doing well. Unfortunately, we're still struggling with the high school cadet classes. And uh, it's only about a 50% pass rate first attempt for National Registry and 58% after the second attempt. So um, our tablet testing uh, process continues uh, to roll out as new programs are revised. They're going right into the uh, tablet testing uh, program. So we're seeing much success with that. Uh, the NFPA consolidation project continues. Um, lots and lots and lots of classes because of the NFPA consolidation project are uh, currently in pilot and being revised and slated for uh, revision or creation. So there's nine classes still in pilot, 20 that are being revised at the current time and 11 that are on the ticket to be revised or uh, created. Uh, the only other thing I have is the numbers from the last MICRB board uh, meeting was there's about 784 instructors uh, in the state, 17 instructor trainers, and uh, 258 instructor evaluators as of the last MICRB meeting. So I'm gonna ask Mr. Marlette to cover the um, Instructor two and three issue uh, and the capital project in Western Maryland. Thank you. Um, the MICRB uh, regulations, we ran into an issue. It was reported to you on, uh, on, I think, at several meetings that we had an issue with the instructor two and instructor three and the way the law, well, the regulations, excuse me, were written. Uh, the changes in the NFPA 1041 basically required a great deal more for Instructor 3 than what was being provided. And everybody always thought they were only getting Instructor 2 in the state of Maryland to begin with. So we went back and proposed a change. That has gone through. Uh, we still have an instructor three course for anyone that wants it. We have an instructor three, but the state certified emergency services instructors do not have to go through a instructor three course. Instructor three course would be primarily for people who manage training centers or manage training sections or departments, but not day-to-day -day instructors. They would still do uh, a level two program uh, but that's all been completed and is now finalized uh, it took us a while to get through that uh, and working with the uh, Attorney General's office and others uh, with the Commission I mean the uh, Commission and with the State Board for Higher Education all that's completed Western Maryland project uh, is nearing completion. We're anticipating moving back in uh, the second, uh, early or mid-second quarter 
of 23. We will definitely be back in by uh, the end of second quarter. I say that definitely, unless something very unforeseen happens. Uh, contractors moving along very, very well. Good quality work. I think the people are going to be very, very pleased in Western Maryland when they get back in there. Uh, but that's, that's going along very, very well. And we've had a great relationship working with Frostburg University in our temporary facilities. And they've been very, very good with us and working with us. We've just notified them that we will be terminating the lease uh, June 30 of 23, which basically was required with the lease that we had with the with the university there. But they they couldn't have been uh, better to work with. They've been they've been great, and that's all I have. Unless someone has questions. Yeah, anybody have any questions for us? Any questions? Thank you, gentlemen. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Emergency management. Terry. Good morning. Good morning. I bring you uh, greetings from the secretary, uh, Russ Strickland. He is uh, had family coming in from out of town this weekend, so he asked me to come down and uh, present the report. Uh, it was sent in electronically. Should have it. Uh, just a couple of highlights. Uh, uh, as you can see, the state of Maryland and the university have gone into a partnership on Mesonet, which is a uh, weather system for it will be 75 uh, uh, observing tires spanning the state. And uh, we were part of that project, and that was kicked off a couple of weeks ago with the governor. Um, I cannot, cybersecurity is a uh, very important thing. Um, everybody's got to stay vigilant and, and uh, on it. We had an incident this week. I, uh, in the state uh, it really lasted uh, probably 10 days uh, it was on a system in one of the jurisdictions and uh, it did uh, give a little minor problem with with the 911 system but they were able to suffice that's why I, when I worked at I said, that's why you always kept pencil and paper. Uh, so, they, uh, yesterday evening or last night, they said that had been taken care of. Um, we just put out a grant to community partners to keep Maryland safe for $693,000. Uh, me, uh, MDEM, along with some other jurisdictions and other state agencies, were recognized by the governor for uh, assisting with the two catastrophes, uh, the tornadoes in Florida 
and the water situation in Mississippi. Anne Arundel County sent people down to Mississippi, and so did WSSC from over in Prince George, Montgomery County. And uh, we did all the uh, EMAC uh, things with that, and, uh, and so we were glad to help. And during that time, we also assisted one of the local jurisdictions with a um, funeral. Um, I think everything else is pretty well self-explanatory. I will tell you this, that we are now down to two liaisons. Uh, John Reginaldi, uh, even though he's still there, he's not there because he's burning the leave up. Uh, so we've got John Delina, who's in the back with me, and Bill Hildebrand. And uh, if you need anything and you can't reach one of them, please feel free to contact me because I'll, we'll, John and I worked on something this week and, and, uh, and that's, they're very valuable to the jurisdictions. And uh, I guess, I don't know what's gonna happen because I guess they're waiting for the new governor to make his decisions, um, but uh, so it might it might take a little time, but just remember I'm always available. Any questions? Any questions? Thank you, Terry. You're welcome. <clears throat> Anyone from forestry? Sorry, I didn't see you come in. All right. Good morning. Um, so you should have my report electronically. I'm just going to hit the highlights. Um, so far in uh, 2022, uh, pretty, pretty much a normal fire season for us as far as wildfire response goes. Um, 123 fires uh, burning just over 3,000 acres. Uh, numbers, the number of fires is down slightly, uh, but the acreage is, is right about normal. Uh, and you can see the breakdown in the report there for the uh, different regions. Most of the acreage burned is here on the shore, and that's our, our marsh fuels. Um, one, one thing that's uh, been an uptick for us and will probably be continued uptick is our number of prescribed burns throughout the state. Um, our numbers were up significantly this year, uh, burning over 8, 000, almost 9,000 acres. Um, throughout the state and those numbers are going to hopefully continue to rise as, as more and more people uh, see the benefits of prescribed fire um, for resource benefits as well as you know, hazard fuels, hazardous fuel reduction. We did do a, a pretty high profile burn at Rocky Gap State Park uh, three weeks ago, something like that. It was very successful uh, for resource benefits, uh, pretty really high profile right along the highway there. So um, it, it was pretty well received um, and you probably start seeing more of that kind of stuff happening throughout the state. Um, if any of the departments are, are willing to uh, uh, provide some people that uh, want to become more in, interested in prescribed fire, um, we're, we're more than welcome to or we welcome you to, uh, to assist with those kind of things. Uh, the more partners we have, the better. Um, personnel and staffing continues. Uh, we, we are uh, probably have more turnover now on the you know in the forest service than we have in the past 30 years uh, seems like we're always uh, hiring new people just because of all the retirements uh, we do have a new director um, Kenneth Jolly was um, uh, appointed as our director about three weeks ago um, that position has been vacant for three years uh, finally finally did the appointment there uh, Kenneth was uh, most recently our associate director for uh, operations uh, he's uh, over 30 years of experience with the agency um, Uh, the volunteer fire assistance program, the grant program that we administer through the U.S. Forest Service, we had 59 applications from uh, departments in 15 counties. Um, we were able to award 53 uh, grants this year uh, in almost $130,000, $137,000 in match grants uh, throughout the state. Um, yeah, 
so that was pretty good we were able to fund more than we normally are <clears throat> excuse me there is a new grant program that's coming down uh, has uh, been implemented by the u.s forest service through the uh, infrastructure bill it's called the uh, community wildfire De defense program uh, there's a billion dollars in that program over the next uh, five years uh, 200 million a year um, uh, to uh, help communities that are, are at risk of wildfire um, there's a lot of uh, Nuances to the program, it's kind of new to us. We're trying to wrap our heads around it, but uh, there are there is quite a bit of funding there for communities that, that are at risk. Um, and we will be uh, rolling that program out. We didn't have any applications um, in October for, for Maryland. Uh, we hope to change that in the spring. Um, it is a competitive um, grant program, so you have to apply um, for the grant and you know it's it's out of you know the whole country. So here in the east we have it's an uphill battle to be able to get some of those grants, but there are communities that are worthy here in the East as well. Um, so look for more on that. We are hoping to hire um, a uh, long-term contractual to help run that program um, after the first of the year. Uh, training, um, our, we did uh, warden, forest warden training for 20 personnel um, back in October, new wardens. So we are hiring a lot of new people. So we provided training for those people um, the 2023 Mid-Atlantic uh, Wildfire Academy will be once again held at uh, Garrett College. Um, um, that will be June 12th through the 16th. There will be entry level courses, the entry basic wildland firefighter courses as well as advanced courses. Um, and any new wildland firefighters that uh, departments want to train in Maryland, that, that training is free for Maryland residents. Um, uh, the basic wildland training is, is free. Um, so uh, take advantage of that. Um, uh, we were busy again once again this year with interagency fire support we started in in March uh, we sent some stuff up to Pennsylvania and to Wisconsin and Michigan um, supporting uh, wildfires in the spring and it continued all through the summer um, supporting incidents in, in um, uh, 10 different states throughout the country uh, with 78 personnel uh, engines, dozers, um, and uh, single resources. Uh, we got our, our last resources returned home uh, right at the end of October. Um, and as soon as we got back, we had requests from other states uh, in the Southeast and uh, Ohio looking for help and we weren't able to uh, assist with those. But uh, continues, fire season continues to be almost a year, year long thing now throughout the, throughout the, the West and the South. So we're gonna be, continue to be busy with that. Um, and then just the last thing, I'll, I'll try to push the Federal Access Property Program again. Uh, if there's anything that we can help you guys with as far as uh, uh, Federal Access equipment, uh, we are getting a few more people who are able to screen for that equipment and uh, be able to help you guys out with, with your needs. So if you have any needs, they, there is a, a form you can submit for, uh, uh, to request property and we'll do our best to, to see if we can get it for you. If anything else, any questions, that's all I got. Any questions for forestry? Okay, Tim. Chris, on the federal excess property, is it, are they trying to do like one contact person for each county to work with DNR um, on that? No, it's it's been a, it's been a department based, you know. Okay. Yeah. So each department individually can submit a thing and and, and work with us individually. I okay. mean, if if you have somebody that wants to work on a countywide basis, we can we can discuss that as well. Okay. So it, it's still each department can go ahead and contact. Correct. Okay. Yep. All right. We we were told that there was a representative. No, it's it's still on a department. Okay. Yeah. All case right. by case basis. Yeah. Roger. Good morning. Thank you for being here. On the federal property, when we submit that form, is there any follow-up on that so we know you received it or anything because we don't get anything back? Well, we're probably not doing a good job of following up on that. We, we do look at that form, um, and we, we try to prioritize you know, based on when, this, when, the, uh, when it comes in. They are time-stamped, so we try to, see, try to fill the first orders first, uh, depending on what the property is. But, yeah, we're... We have your request, and we're we're constantly looking. So. Okay, uh, what I mean is that, but you don't acknowledge that you received it. We don't. So we don't know. We just know it goes somewhere, and 
I know we've got property from you. Make, we appreciate I'll, that. I'll make note of that, but and so we can we can follow. It'd up. It'd be nice if we got a follow up, just saying that you received it anyway. Yeah, absolutely. Okay. Thank you. Good idea. Yep. Any other questions? Thank you. Thank you. Appreciate it. Maryland Memorial. Dennis or Jean? I saw him in the back. I saw you come in, so. See where my pride is. <laughs> I didn't see it. Yeah, what that? Huh? Yes, he did. That shouldn't bother you. Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, what a lovely ride I had from uh, beautiful Carroll County. Uh, I don't know what the good Lord's trying to do, but... Uh, this is back-to-back -back weekends that come down this way in this kind of weather. But anyhow, uh, on behalf of the Memorial Foundation, first of all, I want to thank all of you in this room. All of you in this room to include the ladies for what you've done for us in the past. Um, COVID hit us hard, um, but unlike some of the departments here in the state that was able to recoup some funds from local jurisdictions, um, if the memorial would have been in, I know in, in my county in Carroll, I, I could have got some, some help, but we didn't have that happen. Um, but we survived. We survived. Um, this past year at our service, uh, we recognized 10 LODDs. And um, um, the, the, the sad thing is when the memorial was dedicated in 2003, 330 names was on the wall. With the 10 names that we put up this past June, we are now at 451. We're running out of space. Um, but thankful to um, uh, some work, and I, I gotta give them a lot of credit because they did some behind the scenes work and that was the Professional Firefighters of Maryland um, they made a couple phone calls to me, but basically they, they dealt with the politicians uh, and they was able to come up and got us a $250,000 grant. The only strings attached to that grant is it must be used for capital uh, expenditures. Um, that's a big help, but one of the, one of the avenues were, were really, it, it costs us in the neighborhood of Thirty-five to forty-two thousand dollars a year to keep that memorial up to what it should be. So we're still out here struggling to try to find those monies. Um, so with that in mind, uh, Gene and myself and my vice president Steve Hardesty, um, we have met with a construction company. Uh, with the, the, the construction company that originally built the memorial for us. Um, and also an architect. The architect is out of Annapolis. Matter of fact, his office is not too far from the State Street uh, complex. So um, we're in the early stages. And as uh, I announced to our committee at our last meeting, and there seemed to be no objections, um, we're going to move along, but there will be no construction started no construction started until after this June 23 program I don't I um, I just <laughs> um, I, I want I want the memorial to to look appropriate for for our program and so um, unless somebody and, and um, We've not seen any drawings yet because um, um, they had to do a complete survey. Um, I think that was done within the last two weeks um, before the architect can really get us some drawings for us to look at. So um, 
that's that's where we stand. Um, I'm looking forward to Ocean City. Um, one of the things that uh, I will probably bring out there, um, within the last two weeks, uh, I was at uh, John Hoagland's wife called me, and I want to thank past president Tom Mattingly because he put the bug in her ear. But John's collection of, um, and that's the first time I was ever in his house, and there's lots of things I would love, <laughs> oh boy. But anyhow, his collection of fire department mugs and cups has been given to the Memorial Foundation for us to do with as we see fit. Um, I'm not sure um, what exactly we're gonna do. Um, but uh, she boxed them up. I have a catalog. Um, if anybody's in the club, in the collection of those items, uh, I might can make you a deal. Um, but I'm not going to give them to you. Um, but um, anyhow, uh, I picked them up and they're currently um, in storage at, at my facility in Sykesville. Um, this year. Um, since our gala, <clears throat> and um, this was the 16th, I think 16th year for the gala, but uh, since the gala, the committee sit down and we basically did a complete evaluation of the first 16 years. We looked at the good, the bad, whatever, but anyhow, we've made a decision that our 17th annual gala will be held back in Annapolis at the Doubletree Hotel uh, on September the 23rd. Um, I'm, I'm very fortunate that uh, former past president of MSFA and a board member of now the foundation, Mike Faust, uh, has volunteered to chair that project and I appreciate him stepping forward to do that. Um, there's no change in our officers for the coming year. Um, again, my, my Vice President is Steve Hardesty, Sharon Owens is our Secretary, Michelle Malin, Treasurer. Uh, one year left in the board will be Bert Small and Teresa Crisman, and then Mike was elected for a two-year term. With the holiday season coming up, um, you know, a lot of times I know some of you in this room, your wife, your children, your grandchildren are saying, hey, what is it you would like? And if you're at my age, if I want anything, I normally go to the store and buy it. Um, but why don't you recommend to these, your family, you know, I would like to have a brick with my name, my department at Annapolis. And we can make it happen. Um, the bricks that we sell are, are not memorial bricks they're an honor and remembrance etc so um you know when you go home from this and uh, the grandkids come up and say pappy pap whatever they call you what would you like to have um send them to our website and we'll we'll sell them a brick and um i i think i i've, I've, I've covered um everything all uh, i got a phone call last night we had a home builder in Carroll County donate and I don't have all the particulars but I know what's on our website donated I think it's either two or four tickets to the Ravens game that's going to be on December 24th I know it's a bad time we tried to auction that off uh, online I'm sorry to say we've not gotten any bids if any of you in this room follow that ball club okay Here's my allegiance. I, I don't believe in the professional game. I love my terps. Um, but make us an offer, and um, I, I hate I hate to see him. I hate to see him tossed. Oh, is that what it is? Okay. All right. So, um, brother Gene. Just in case anybody didn't hear that, Teresa indicated that's an $1,800 package.
fish tails. Okay. Right. Yeah, Gene, Gene reminded me one thing, um, and this is something that we've tried to, to do in conjunction with the annual memorial service, um, but um, fish tails at Ocean City um, has been wonderful to us, um, and we normally run that right after the memorial service. I appreciate your all's participation. Uh, they've been very, very, very good to us. And then the other, the other corporate sponsor that I that, that really has, um, they've they have since they've opened up the new Mission Barbecue in Westminster. We just recently received check number four, and they've given us over ten grand. And so, for those of you who live in the Carroll County area, the Baltimore County that slide into Westminster, um, again, I, I, I truly, truly. I appreciate it. And, and folks, um, you know, at, at times I could kick a, a, a certain career chief's butt for getting me involved in this project because of many talks that I had with Don Mooney, I knew what was going to happen. Um, it's, a, it's a beautiful place. Um, I had a chat with one of the most recent Frederick County uh, widows the other day, and, and again, she thanked me that um, it, it's a place that her and her two daughters can get in their car and it's a distance for them to drive but they can go down and, and she can talk to her husband and the daughters can talk to dad so um, again thank you thank you thank you um, especially I know the state ladies sometimes you might think that, that we're overlooking you we are not God bless um, I love you all and I appreciate what your, your auxiliaries uh, have done for us, and, 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 and we appreciate, appreciate the support. Chip, that's just for uh, information for resources if you need it. Uh, Jeep A Break, a life member at the Junior Fire Company, has gone through all 31 line of duty deaths in Frederick County and has developed a manual. He's got every news article, old newspapers and every line of duty death has several pages that and some of them i mean I'll go back to 1840 of all the line of duty deaths in frederick county so we will have that available at the fire museum in emmitsburg uh where we have our line of duty deaths on our wall but he's done a tremendous job like i said it's, it's a manual that big of anything he could find news uh, all the different newspapers maybe something from the baltimore sun a cumberland paper and it's just uh, amazing the amount of research he's done so if anybody if frederick county should call you that is a resource that they can you know certainly available to the foundation because we're still looking for pictures i did forget one thing and in the spirit of christmas and out in my car i have a sales table i will sell anybody that wants a nice t-shirt or a coin for 10 bucks after lunch all right i'm gonna bring the box in here i can't go any lower all right um but if anybody's interested in our the t-shirts that we had this year um at ocean city we've got we still have some left um i've got some challenge coins and um it's not going to us any good I, I need to get rid of them they're great christmas presents but whatever you want to give somebody ten dollars okay see me after lunch and okay brother cox one thing where do we stand reference the <laughs> the the new the name have they been delivered to the training facilities they they were framed okay. uh some are still in my office i handed out seven at council of academies thursday okay. and regional personnel are delivering them the rest of them okay again, I, I need the room in my office <laughs> they are big i um again i, I want to thank you and, and your your boss for for making that happen um and, and and i know that um some of you may have saw we had it at, at ocean city and um i think we, we also had it up at the gale i wasn't sure how much room i had here today and it was raining and I, I didn't bring it along. But basically, it's an updated, Mifri has updated the list of all of the fallen heroes that's on the wall in Annapolis to include the last 10. And those are being delivered to all Mifri facilities and all training facilities in the state of Maryland. 
and then um, I have one uh, to share if you got something come up I know we will be at, I understand what you are having a reception in Annapolis and I, I would like to bring that to the legislative session uh, reception if, if, if you all are, are, are hosting that again I heard some Somebody we, told me you're going to do it. So. The one for 17 state circle. Do you want to deliver, or you want us to go ahead and deliver it? Well, you have one for state circle. Yes, I do. Um, I only have one, and I'm sort of keeping that for the memorials to use it. I'll get with you on the list. Okay. All right. Super. All right, folks. Thank you again. Thank you for because I I thought you were going to squeeze me in here late afternoon, but thank you very much. I can get saw you come in. Oh, okay. Any questions? Ron? Yes. Seven o'clock Sunday night. Any other questions for? Thank you. Appreciate everything that you're doing. Maryland Fire Chiefs, uh, I don't see, is the president here? Okay. Harv, Vice President. No? Well, you are. <laughs> okay. I knew we had a representative here. Good morning. Um, I'm representing the trickle down effect here this morning. <laughs> the President couldn't make it, and the next in line couldn't, and all that. So here we are. Hi. Yeah, John's here. John's here too, second vice president. Uh, Phillips, <laughs> first vice president. I thought he was going to jump up there. Go ahead. You have a, uh, when did you get here? <laughs> I've been here. Yeah. Um, yeah. I just have a couple things. We had a we had our uh, a membership meeting on November six up at Falston in Hartford County. Uh, what we're doing now with the meetings is in the morning having a meeting, then we break for lunch, then we have a training session. Uh, one of the hopes of that is is to try to get some more folks, active duty folks, involved with our organization. It's been going over pretty good. We've been getting good feedback on it, uh, and that and we have the uh, in December, correct, Bob? Down here in Ocean City, next weekend we have our training program, very well attended. Uh, got a lot of repeat folks coming back. Uh, we're also meeting with our transportation committee to talk about the uh, Fallen Firefighters Weekend. Uh, we talked with Jeff Thompson. We're going to be having a meeting in uh, January with that group. Uh, it's tough this year because we just had an event in October, and we have to go back in May and repeat what we had started. So we're going to look at some of that. We're looking at our finances and trying to do some sponsorships etc for that so that's all I have you have anything or Bob you have anything okay. yeah just um, already covered the, uh, the training the uh, spring training event that uh, we've sponsored for so many years the Hoagland seminar will be coming up at the uh, University of Maryland Shady Grove facility again the only thing is, you're going to have to watch your emails. At this moment, I do not have a date yet, unless you have one. Okay. Uh, date will be announced as soon as we get it and um, make plans for that. It's probably one of the best ones we do. Eastern Division International Association of Fire Chiefs 2023 convention or conference will be, uh, sure it will. They'll be here in Ocean City on April 21st and 22nd. I would respectfully defer to uh, past President Paul Sterling uh, for any additional information on that. You can see Paul when you get a chance and he'll fill you in. Um, we're continuing to uh, support recruitment and retention efforts when we can across the state. Uh, working uh, closely with the MSFA on that. Also, uh, I have returned to my earlier position as the chairman of the Legislative Committee for the Fire Chiefs. I'll be working very, very closely with the MSFA Legislative Committee. One thing we have to do in Annapolis, and, and we all agree on it, I believe, is that um, if you're going to talk to anybody in Annapolis, you have to present a united front. Everybody has to be on the same page. 
and we're working very hard to make uh, make sure that message gets out to everyone, and that is the way we'll be doing business this year. Uh, any questions? Any questions, uh, fire chiefs? Thank you. Are there any partners that I missed? Okay. We we'll move into the financial team. Treasurer, financial secretary, uh, budget committee vice chair. So good morning to everybody. It's a pleasure to be here and uh, send some holiday greetings to all of you before we get started uh, as we enter in that season. Uh, for the financial team, there should have been three financial reports that were submitted in the report section. Balance sheet, profit and loss, budget versus actual. Any questions on those? If I could, uh, if you would look at the balance sheet I just want to make a note. We've been working on um, some historical perspectives, and the current balance sheet identifies, as of December 1st, 2022, that our current net assets for the association are $2,878,496.50. What I like to do is go back to December 1st in 2007 when the finance team was instructed to automate the system, go to QuickBooks, and increase our capabilities of tracking our expenditures. Our current assets at that time was dollars so we've increased our net assets by almost $2 million in 15 years. And that's through the efforts of the leadership of this association, the finance team, and us keeping our expenditures in check. So I just wanted to make that as a historical note. That's a pretty significant milestone for us and some good fiscal stability for this association. Questions? Awesome. Uh, the 2023- excuse me, the 2022-2023 budget has been loaded into QuickBooks as a result of the Ocean City meeting, the convention. So uh, it is, it is uh, in place and uh, we are following through on those budget recommendations. We have signed a contract again with Fight Connor Associates, which is the accounting firm in Lavelle that does our financial review and uh, that aspect of both the income and expenses reviews are underway. And uh, we're working with uh, the accountants to ensure that we have another financial report by the time we get to the beach next year. We did have to do some adjustments to the income and expense categories, realign them based upon some of the internal discussions by the budget committee. Um, I'm sure that um, there may be some questions down downstream, but what we're trying to do is have a better projection of where our expenditures are and most importantly, where our income is coming from. All the checking accounts have been reconciled as of October 31st, 2022, and MLGIP accounts as of October 31st as well. And that's a two-step process. We take the uh, bank statements, reconcile them with QuickBooks, and then send it to the assistant treasurer, uh, Bobby Jacobs, who does a, a, a third-party review of that, and then off to the accountant it goes. All of the W2Gs, which is the uh, tax reporting for the gaming from the winners of the raffle, have been filed. And our tax liability for the past year has been paid to the Internal Revenue Service. That's something that we have to do immediately following the convention, paying on taxes for those individuals that we had uh, deductions relative to their winnings. <clears throat> we will be now working on the 1099Rs which is the report of the revenue to the Widows and Orphans Fund. Each of those recipients uh, receive a 1099 from us. 
and we'll also be working with Bessie Marshall to get the 1099s out for each of the awards that they uh, provide to their membership. Uh, also, we'll have to do the 1099 for the executive director in that uh, that's a 1099 uh, NEC which because of her contract status. All that needs to be filed by the end of January. So uh, we've got a little bit of paperwork coming up over the next month and a half. Uh, the SAFER grant has been moving along fairly well. Uh, we've had uh, some significant expenditures. Uh, the last reimbursement was uh, about 150000 from FEMA, and I think we're getting ready to submit another $200,000 reimbursement. Uh, that process between the MSFA and the Maryland Fire Chiefs is going well. There's a whole lot of paperwork in that tracking, and it's keeping all of us uh, hopping pretty steadily. Uh, credit card reconciliation in the policy review. Uh, we went through and made sure that we had signed agreements with every credit card holder within the MSFA just so that they're familiar with the credit card procedures, just to do an update and uh, due diligence on that. So that's been completed, and those are on file in the office in Crofton with the executive director. Uh, we have already received our annual allotment for appropriations fund and widows and orphans fund from the Maryland uh, Department of Emergency Management. MDEM, I think they're called now these days. And so uh, we have that in the bank, and uh, we are uh, proceeding forward with uh, those allotments. And uh, the sales tax exempt certificate for MSFA has been updated with the comptroller for the state of Maryland. I handed out the tax exempt cards to the officers and to those people that have credit cards to do purchases. So that allows us not to pay sales tax on um, elements for both the MSFA and the LA MSFA. Any questions on those items that I have? Then I will pass it to the financial secretary. One mic. One mic. Good morning. Uh, this is the busy time of year, which is a good thing because the dues are, will be due. Uh, all the dues invoices have been loaded into QuickBooks, they've been printed, they've been stuffed in the envelopes and they're awaiting the uh, delivery to the post office which will occur on December the 30th. Ten days later than normal because I'm trying to alleviate a problem, sort of, that new officers take effect on January the 1st. So what happens is if they get them before then, some companies will get the checks right to me new officers take over and then I get a second check from the company and I got to turn around and mail it back to them. So um, I'm trying to alleviate that problem. I'm going to be mailing them on December the 30th. Uh, and I do ask that the companies wait to pay until they get the invoice. Um, and the, my assistant financial secretary, Bobby Aaron, has reported that all the inventory of the association is up to date. And that's my report. Thank you. Budget. Good morning. Um, Budget Committee had a Zoom meeting on uh, November the 15th. Um, there were two issues that were discussed. Um, we had had a request from Rural Water Supply to purchase uh, shirts for the committee members. Um, normally, the Budget Committee's rejected all those uh, requests, but uh, a proposal was put forth that if a committee wanting to purchase shirts uh, would sell a, an equivalent amount of the uh, raffle tickets that we would consider approving their purchasing shirts for their committee. It's a way of uh, having a net cost basis for us. Uh, it gives them what they want and um, can, if they sell more than enough tickets, it helps raise additional funds for the committee. So uh, that's the uh, one proposal that the budget committee is putting forth. Uh, and we recommend the exec committee approve. Um, there was a second uh, issue that was discussed. Uh, the Ways and Means Committee uh, is having trouble getting sufficient people to help sell raffle tickets at the uh, Spring Fest and the Sun Fest in Ocean City. Um, matter of fact, the exec committee chairman and his wife had to come back from North Carolina to help out uh, at the one event this year. 
and they still didn't have enough people. So proposal was put forth uh, that uh, if people came down and helped um, and worked at least uh, a portion or a major portion of two days that they be reimbursed for travel and hotel on the same schedule as the exec committee meetings. Um, the Ways and Means Committee have uh, made up some guidelines uh, that would be followed, uh, and I'm sure Mitch will uh, discuss those. But uh, that's a way for us to, again, sell more tickets, we bring in more money. Mitch, I'll just pass it out. Go ahead. Okay, you want me to do the report and then, and then add that to it while I've got it? Or you just want to go right to it? Let's go ahead and handle this first. Okay. Uh, so basically, as you saw the handout, um, what I've proposed is, is a three-step. Uh, the first one, the recommendations for mileage reimbursement would be the same rules and stipend as the executive committee meetings based on mileage, one way, non-fire department vehicle. Uh, the second recommendation for the hotel reimbursement, uh, the same stipend as the executive committee meetings, which I believe is $65 a night. And it would be paid out as follows. You have to work a minimum of six hours per day for two days to equal the first night. That means you've got to be there at least two days to get one night. And then each additional six hour day would equal one additional night. So if you're there for three days, you're going to get two nights. And if you're there the, the entire time, you don't, uh, four days, you would get three nights, maximum of three nights. And then I'm, I'm asking for the fourth night for booth set up at the discretion of the Ways and Means Chair. Normally, myself and the Vice Chair come down and set the booth up. Actually, I come down on Tuesday, but he comes down and he would be available or whoever we get to come and help set that booth up would get that the extra night because we would have to be down here Wednesday to set up. Procedure for reimbursement. Uh, the request for reimbursement form would need to be completed. The hotel receipt needs to be attached. The Ways and Means Chair would approve the request by signing the form and then the Ways and Means Chair would forward that form to the Treasurer for payment. Just as we do now, we're following the same, the same thing. Um, I just want to note that these two events in Ocean City bring in an average of $15,000 uh, to, uh, to the association. So that was the guidelines that I, you know, I came up with for, for the uh, committee and for your uh, approval. Okay, what I'd like to do is, uh, first of all, the first recommendation of the budget committee is that if a given committee wants shirts, they sell equal amount of raffle, and then they would be eligible for the shirts. Do I have a motion for that? Motion by uh, Randy Smith, second by Robbie. Sorry, Rob. <laughs> Drew a blank. Any discussion? Hearing none, all in favor say aye. aye. Any opposed? Motion carries unanimously. Robbie. I was <laughs> the second uh, proposal is the support for the Ways and Means Committee and uh, using the same mileage reimbursement and hotel reimbursement and the guidelines as set forth by the Ways and Means Committee. Do I have a motion? Motion by Robbie, second by Ron Block. Any discussion? No discussion, all in favor say aye. aye. Any opposed? Unanimous. Ways and means. Thanks. G, you have anything else? Okay, um, Ways and Means report. Um, we've been busy selling tickets since the August Executive Committee meeting. Uh, 
We did uh, 5,206 at Sunfest, and what happened is we got hit by the weather again. We were good for Thursday, Friday, Saturday. They shut down 8 o'clock Saturday night, did not have anyone attend on Sunday. They actually closed it because they were expecting a nor'easter to form off the coast and high winds again. This was the same thing that happened at Springfest. So right now we have $7,570 in the bank and we're about $3,176 behind last year. Um, again, we, we had a full Sunfest last year, so that, that one day was probably about $1,500. And we lost Darlington Apple Fest due to rain, so that would have been another fifteen dollars to $2,000. Um, all the uh, member companies should have their tickets. Uh, thanks to you for getting those out. Um, if you have your checks or tickets completed, uh, if they companies would like to, they can uh, either give them to you to bring to me at a meeting, they can mail them to me, or they can bring them to the convention. And again, the next large event that the committee will attend will be Spring Fest here in Ocean City, Thursday, May 4th through Sunday, May 7th in 2023. And um, I do want to thank the, the ones that did come down to Springfest as, or Sunfest. As you heard, Steve and Nancy cut their vacation short in North Carolina and came up uh, and worked three days. I had my co-chair Willard and Barb Evans, uh, Darlene and myself. Darlene had her cochlear implant that Monday. I left her with a friend on Tuesday to come down and help set up and went right back home the same day. And then we, she felt she did so well with the operation, we were allowed to, to uh, come right back down on Friday. And we actually worked Saturday and we were gonna work Sunday until the, uh, until the weather. Joan Kramer uh, from uh, the Ladies Auxiliary, Skip Carey was there and uh, Sam and Sherry Sowers. Of course, we weren't all there at the same time, but that was all we had. And that's why we proposed what we did. Maybe we can get a couple more people down. Um, and Saturday was probably one of the biggest crowds I've seen at Sunfest in a long time. And we didn't have enough people to open to one side. We can only work off, of, off the front and one side. If we could have opened that third side up uh, where the tent, they were coming out of the tent, we probably could have done another maybe 15 to 2,000 that day. We just didn't have the people to work it. Um, in addition to that, I was handed a picture. So we did get a little advertisement in the dispatch down here. Um, we have a picture of uh, second vice president Skip Carey or, and Joan Kramer and my uh, vice chair Willard Evans and his wife Barb was in the dispatch. One of the uh, ladies, Charlene Sharp, who does people in society calm down here, took their picture. So uh, we, get, we did get a little advertisement in the uh, dispatch down here with it. So, okay, that's the report. Any questions to the financial team? Just a comment on ways and means. Um, I say it many, many times, if every company would sell all the tickets that they're given, we could double the income. Normally, we only get 50% back or less. Uh, I think it's been even 40%. And if we could go back to the companies and ask them, we're only asking them to sell $100 worth. If they would sell that, we could double our income. Yeah, another point is uh, if Jarrettsville next, next Sunday or Saturday, Jarrettsville is going to have their uh, craft show. And I'll, I don't ask anybody to sell tickets. We have, and you were there a couple, you know, a couple months ago, and we have what I call the intersection in the middle. We have crafters in the bays, all the equipment's out. We have crafters in the hall. And I sit in the middle, and I put a table up like this down the hallway where the bunk rooms are. I don't say a word, and I'll bring in $450. They just walk in and buy tickets. I mean, it's not hard to do. They just, if we could just, I don't know. I, I'm, I'm speechless as why they don't sell them. Anything else for finance? Okay. Ron, you want to do convention? So we'll switch into convention. If any of the other uh, chairs or co-chairs want to join me, please feel free. Uh, on July 14th of uh, this, this past year, we held the convention critique for the 2022 event. Um, basically, uh, we pulled the convention off, had some concerns about uh, recovering from COVID. Uh, obviously, our numbers across the board were down. 
Uh, Jolly Rogers was only a thousand participants. Normally, it's around 1,400. Prayer breakfast was way down uh, this past year. Memorial service is about 1,100 people, and that usually is around 1,800 people. And the opening ceremonies was only 800. And I think that some of that was driven by the scheduling of, you know, the schools, the cost of fuel. Uh, people not sure with COVID and, and vacations, but but either way, uh, the convention overall I think was successful, and uh, the convention did end up in the black at the end of the year, so we covered all the costs. We just finished paying off all the hotel bills, and the convention actually turned a little bit of a profit, so that's not a bad thing at all. Uh, the first planning meeting was held on November 16th at Odington and issues for 2023. Uh, first of all, there's a proposal by a, a separate group of our own membership to host the basket bingo on Sunday at the VFW, uh, that Sunday afternoon. So we're looking at that as a, a potential to, to do that. Uh, we've talked with the presidents about doing the presidential banquet uh, separate from doing it at the beach and it actually attach it to the Maryland Memorial schedule. So we would have the banquet on, on the evening after the Maryland Memorial, or the night before, excuse me, the Maryland Memorial in Annapolis. Uh, a lot of people liked the event we had at the Naval Academy. So we're thinking of doing that instead of uh, the event that's at the Clarion in Ocean City. Uh, we are t thinking about possibly adjusting the schedule to fit with the vendors who were there on Sunday. Uh, that seemed to be pretty good opening up on Sunday, but we've got to adjust the uh, memorial possibly, maybe starting earlier and getting people free Sunday night. So we're, we're looking at that. It has not been finalized. Uh, as I had said earlier, the prayer breakfast did not do that well. We're going to talk with the chaplain on possibilities how to uh, either boost that or maybe do that off-site. The difficulty is related to the food at the convention center we've all been down that road before and the costs and the quality are something that's always questionable uh, we are going to reduce the number of classes that we offered we had a huge array of classes in ocean city we did have attendance at all of them but we did get the comments that there was just too many were competing for that time slots so we're probably going to have a little bit less uh, we are doing a complete electronic distribution of all the convention materials this year so we're not mailing out like we have that's a, a cost and unfortunately when it goes to a fire station you don't know who gets it if it ends up on the bulletin board in a file cabinet or in a trash can uh, we are going to try to do some better advertisement of the educational programs to, to let people know the classes that we are going to do we are working with the fools again on that relationship and we hope that uh, that's going to be a significant piece for us. Of course, the one thing we're concerned about is uh, costs of being in Ocean City. If any of you started looking at hotel rooms and condos, uh, the prices are up significantly. Uh, but I have to say that um, we have worked out with the Grand. That'll be our host hotel. And they are honoring the same weekday rate as we had this past year of 199 bucks a night. So that's their weekday rate. Uh, the weekend rate went up 40 bucks a night, uh, but that's not that bad considering. So the, we're gonna go stick with the Grand Hotel again as the host hotel this year. Uh, the cost of the convention center should stay, stay s the same. We have a three year contract, so we have two more years left on that, and then we'll see where that's gonna go. Uh, one of the biggest concerns, of course, that we've heard is the election process. We've had uh, a couple meetings with the Office of the Secretary and how we can kind of smooth that a little bit, make that a little easier. We're looking at some outside vendors possibly uh, or possibly some development of our own software. So that, that, that's more work to be done. Uh, I'm sure the Secretary will, will provide some input on that as we go. Uh, got some complaints about the bus pass location. Obviously took that under consideration. Uh, yeah, I know. Uh, we we kind of lost lost a little bit of hind quarter on that one, but that's a whole other story for another day. Um, uh, but we are going to look at the outside exhibit space. We are going to try to keep that limited to just a front row. That helped with parking considerably, and overall the vendors 
seem to be pretty happy with how that worked, especially with the after event uh, surveys that we did relative to vendor satisfaction. Matter of fact, we already have four vendors that have already booked, so that's a good piece. So that's uh, some of the main issues. Uh, ran anything from administration that you have? Um, no. Nope. Not as I know of. All right. Uh, <laughs> uh, Kate would be here, but she's had uh, some neck injections. She's got some muscle nerve issues, so she could not be here to talk about exhibits. Dave, I don't know if you have anything on exhibits no, at all. Kate's, Kate's got it. Kate's got it. Uh, Bobby Jacobs, finance, anything? Cool. And then I didn't see Kenny Bush, and I know Tommy Mattingly couldn't make it today. Kenny's here? Kenny, anything on program? Okay. That is the convention report. Questions for the convention committee? Chip, go ahead. Several years ago, uh, we used to have the prayer breakfast at Halls. We, we used to do it off-site, so I think there is a, a potential of moving it, you know, to some of the larger restaurants because we used to. Uh, I know Halls. I think there was another one also. That's where it started. Right at Halls. Yeah. 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 So. They, so, the Chaplain and, and, and the committee are going to talk about that. I mean, the, the the problem is, we went to Continental Breakfast and it was still sixteen bucks a head, and it's just too much. Any other questions for convention? Past President Herlock. I'll catch this one. Here. I know the convention committee does an excellent job in searching around for rooms and things like that, but I'm going to give you an example. Last year we stayed at the Grand. The room was 3.31 a night, which you all negotiated. My wife came down later on. Well, I wanted to go back for two more days. She said, I'll give it to you at 183. I got a better price than the MSFA does. So how, that's a hundred and fifty dollars difference. So why is there still question on about the payment and stuff like that? Do you know? Our our rate that they quoted us is one ninety nine. Well, that's for this year. Yeah, for right. this year. Yeah. Well, I've got the one for last year was three thirty one. I don't know, but I'll find out. But I mean, they're just showing the difference. That's, I mean, I know you guys try to do what you can. It's difficult. Right. You're not finding an answer to everything that is down there, and, and the costs are, are just going up. I mean, I'm looking at families and things like that. I don't know how they can continue to do it. A lot of the condos have gone up over $1,000 for just yeah. a week. Well, I talked to Tommy Mattingly, the one that he stays in, went sold the other day for $4 million. Yeah, unbelievable. Yeah. Yes. Uh, well, if you check into it, I would appreciate Thank it. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Okay. John Denver, past President Denver. Oh, there's the hotel guy. <laughs> can we keep our attention here, please? Good morning. Uh, after last year, uh, typically I, I would email out to a, a number of hotels, motels. This year, after working with the uh, Hotel Motel Association, they gave me their, their list and I sent out 40-some uh, emails to different hotels. And their suggestion was maybe not to limit it to just kind of the larger chains like the Hilton and such. But, but go to the kind of family owned ones as well. So I've, I've sent them out. I've heard back from a few. I have, there are a number that I haven't heard back with that I'm going to get back in contact with. But I would like to let everybody know about the uh, response I did get from the carousel. Uh, typically, they, the carousel group had a number of hotels. They would offer uh, rooms at different places at a discount. Last year they said that none of the firefighters were taking advantage of those, so they, they didn't offer anything last year. This year I got a contact back from them. What, what they're offering is a 10% discount for first responders, and they said year-round. So that if a first responder were to come to Ocean City, they, they need to, when they make their reservation, they need to let the hotel know that they are a first responder and uh, they would offer that 10% year round. I'm, I'm hoping that some of the other hotels will see that and, and make similar offers. They, they have not yet, but I'm, I'm really hoping for that. So I'll let everyone know about, about those developments anyhow. Any other questions for the convention committee? Thank you. We appreciate your efforts.
Ron, while you're here, National Fall on Firefighters? Sure. One more report. Uh, obviously, the Memorial Weekend this year went, went well. We had 148 firefighters that were honored. And uh, being back on campus and having everything back open made a world of difference relative to uh, being able to honor those individuals. Uh, as you heard, we are moving the memorial service next year to May. Uh, we're trying to get away from the federal government shutdown. Uh, twice we have been pulled off campus and not been able to use the grounds. So we're working to try to avoid that from happening. Plus, uh, I've been in Emmitsburg in October and it's been 90 degrees and I've been up here and it's been snowing. So we're, we're going to try to address that with going to a springtime event. Uh, the plans are well underway for that. Uh, we currently have about 90 uh, cases already approved, so we're figuring it's going to be about 110 by the time we're done. Uh, what's increased that is the additions to the criteria. There was a, a standardized criteria formed in 1997, which included heart attacks, but since then we've added COVID, cancer, and uh, now with the new federal legislation, suicide will be included. So there will be cases that meet certain criteria will be added as line of duty deaths. So it's increasing the number of, of eligible uh, individuals for the recognition, which is a good thing, but also it's going to create more work and efforts for the foundation. So uh, we appreciate all the work that the Maryland Fire Service has given to us. Uh, as you heard from the Maryland Fire Chiefs report, they do a lot of the transportation for us. There's, there are costs associated with that that they take on, and we appreciate that. MSFA is intimately involved with what we do, and it, it is a joint effort across the country to, to make sure that those individuals are honored uh, when we do that service. Questions about anything related to the foundation? I think the chaplain has some. Any questions? That is correct. Uh, uh, thanks, Dave. Uh, Jim Seavey will be honored this year. Uh, his case, uh, his cancer case was approved by PSOB. Uh, it came as a result of uh, the state of Maryland acknowledging that at the government level, and so it, it fit right in with the criteria. So he will be a uh, added to the memorial in, in May. Thanks, Dave. Any Jim. other questions? Dates again? Six, seventh, and eighth, I think it is. Five, six, seven. Five, six, seven. Chaplain? Chaplain Long? At the uh, November meeting of the Maryland Last Team, uh, we decided to offer our assistance to any fire department death because uh, we've gotten a couple requests in to help. With, but now we have a trailer and we have it stocked with stuff. Uh, so we made it a point to, we all came to agreement that we'd, if a fire department needs assistance doing a fire department funeral, honoring one of your own, even if it's not a line of duty death, uh, just reach out to the Maryland Last Team. We'll be glad to come out and assist you in any way we can. Questions on foundation? Any questions? Thank you. Thank you. I think that's everything you have since you're not going to be here tomorrow. It's up to you. It's your committee. Go ahead, Doug. Mr. Chairman, um, strategic initiatives branch, we have scheduled for tomorrow. Okay. Uh, but I just passed out information to everyone, and I would like to take and give a report. Okay. If I may. And I after can. you do that, then we're going to do VCAF. Okay. Go ahead. Um, <clears throat> under strategic initiatives branch, uh, we had a Zoom meeting on November 22nd. Um, about a, uh, I'm going to say a one hour meeting. Uh, participants, uh, 10 participants, uh, we reviewed a few things. Uh, we went over and we were informed um, by the Fight Connor thing uh, for the 1099s and appropriations received. Um, Kate gave us an update on the spots that were filled for uh, recruitment and retention. Um, we were briefed on a name change from Teresa. Uh, <clears throat> workers comp report from CHIP. Uh, safer personnel are employees. We, we were informed of that. Um, 
We had open discussion in reference to the voting procedure and registration. We understand uh, that that is a continuing um, uh, process and understanding on how that's going to go. Um, the main thing that came out of our meeting was a recommendation, and I present before you, uh, the members of the executive board and the presidents, uh, the recommendation of the Strategic Planning Steering Committee for the employment status change of the MSFA director position. Ron, you want to jump up here? Sure. And, and sure. So, so uh, at, at that meeting, I brought it to the attention of the steering committee. For those of us that were involved with the creation of that position almost six years ago now, and unfortunately, our good friend Skip uh, Mahan was intimately involved in that, and he's probably doing better things up there where he is today. But uh, part of that discussion was that when we brought the executive director position on, it would start as a contractual position. Uh, 1099 employee, uh, 1099 individual, and that if the position proved a benefit and satisfactory performance, we'd move it to a full-time employee of the, found of the uh, association. And so that was the discussion six years ago. It's now been five years that, uh, that uh, Kate has been in that position. She's had five continuous years of positive evaluations by each of the past presidents who she served under. Some are here, so you feel free to comment if you'd like. Uh, in addition, um, we have uh, talked with uh, the various components that would be involved in making that decision. For example, one is it would mean we would create a payroll system. And our accounting firm, Ficon Associates, says for a minimal amount, uh, probably about 800 bucks a quarter, they could handle the uh, payroll, taxes, Social Security, all those elements related to that position. Uh, in addition, uh, workers' comp. Actually, we've been covering workers' comp for all of the contractors for uh, the Safer Grant and Kate. So there's really, it isn't going to change any cost relative there, but it just makes it a smoother process. In, in addition, uh, it will provide uh, uh, federal unemployment insurance for uh, the position, and it will, in, in addition, uh, provide uh, a, a process where the MSFA would be responsible for the employer's contribution of the taxes, where right now the contractor pays that out of pocket because they are, are not an employee. So having uh, expressed all that interest, done all that research, it was brought to the steering committee, and, and as Doug said, it is a recommendation of the steering committee to bring it to the executive committee today to favorably move forward with that transition from a contractor to a full-time employee. Question. I'll entertain a motion. Make a motion. Motion by Ron Block, second by Chip Jewell. Any discussion? Ron. We could do January 1st, but it all depends what happens today. You want to amend the motion? Okay. Second or agree? Second, okay. Okay. The motion's amended. Any discussion? Okay. Yes, sir. Bob. The morning we get Correct. Go to your mic, Bob, please. Yeah. No problem. The money we get presently comes from the state appropriation money. Correct. With this becoming a full-time position, does that affect the appropriation at all, or is the same amount of money still going to be given to us on an annual basis? So the, the appropriation funding pays for a variety of things, and the executive director's position was used as a justification when we got the boost. So that's been in that from the very beginning, when we got the increase in the appropriations money. And so with this, the costs related to this change, which may be probably around six six thousand dollars when we're all said and done, would be covered by the appropriations. It's already built into that budget document. 
and that won't affect or change. It, it should um, not take away. Right, it's not going to take away. It should not take away from the appropriation. And that was to my question. Correct, yeah, it's not. becoming a full-time position, right. would the state then be taking that money out of our appropriation? No. Yeah. Okay, thank you. We, well, we'd be paid a bill anyway, so they'd give us the appropriation, and then we we pay the the, the the paychecks. Chip, yeah, I just want to add some clarity with respect to the workers' comp because we've said that the individuals are contract employees, but even before we make her a, a if we make her an employee, the fact that they represent us, we direct them. They're what they call the cardinal defenses that the workers' comp commission commission uses. That are you are are you not an employee? for the sake of benefits. That's why we have maintained workers' comp, even though we call them a contract employee, they, re or they really function as an employee for us and have. So that's why that's done and, and concerned both with our attorney and Ron and I have all researched this to make sure that we're covered. And you're saying, well, there's no exposure. They're working in an office. They hop in a car and they drive to Garrett County. They drive to Ocean City. Well, guess what? Half the line of duty deaths in Frederick County are vehicle accidents. So we do have a tremendous exposure every time somebody gets on the road. So it's really a benefit not only to them if they're injured, but to us because the chances are the commission would rule that even though you don't call them an employee, they are. And I've been involved in many of those. Randy? Um, question I have is um, benefits. I know you talk about working with common so, but if she's going to be a full-time employee or Right. Another, or any other benefits that will come with that, or so, so the the way that um, her, she's not an hourly employee. She she she's on a set fixed rate. Okay. So if if her time causes her to have a sixty hour week or a thirty hour week, it's all the same pay. So it's not like there's there is annual leave and sick leave and those other pieces. Yeah. And there's no time and a half. You know she can adjust. Right. She can adjust her hours accordingly, you know, to maintain a you know a level of forty hours a week. But it might go over that, whereas she can adjust. I just want to make sure we're covering this right. and implied and understood. Correct. Any other discussion? Any other discussion? Does everyone understand the motion? The motion is to make it a full-time position, beginning January first. Hearing none, all in favor say aye. Aye. Any opposed, no. Ayes have it, unanimous. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Doug, thank you. Anything else, Doug? Well, if, if Roger wants to talk about anything past the president stuff, and uh, Chip, any risk management, uh, so that, that'll cover me. So you can X me out for tomorrow. Boy, you you snuck that one in. Thank you. Wow. Football tomorrow. <laughs> that <laughs> no problem. VCAF. VCAF. You want to wait until after? Okay. Okay. No problem. We'll. Well, disregard. They're here. I was going to say I saw him walk in. Don't do it. Joe, can you do it in 15 minutes? Okay. <laughs> I saw him walk in. I figured we get dressed up, we're coming to ask for money. Very good. All right. Good morning, uh, gentlemen. If you give your name for, for the record, it would be appreciated. Uh, Todd Bransky, president of Den Volunteer Fire Company. Ron Weaver, treasurer, Den Volunteer Fire Company. Uh, Denton appeared before the VCAF committee uh, to ask for a loan for a new engine. Uh, after uh, discussion, uh, they originally came in and uh, the engine costs $950,000. Uh, we had a discussion with them. They wanted 712500 
we reduced the amount of the loan to $700,000, which is 74% of the project cost, and they're putting up $250,000, and we reduced the term to a 15-year loan, I believe, I remember. and other than 20. So we did some negotiating, and uh, so they're here today, and uh, if there's any questions, we'll field them. Teresa. So, is it on? So when I looked at the documents we were sent, what the loan amount was that you guys were paying off by the time the engine was delivered did not add up in the document to what the loan amount would be. And I had spoken um, to someone from the VCAF committee and they said there was more discussion Yep. in your meeting can you just clarify that a little bit because it's not really clear in the application well originally uh, the loan amount was uh, 712,000 they requested 712 they requested 712,500 dollars at that's 25 percent down so we negotiated with them at a 20-year loan so we reduced the return to 15 years and they accepted uh, reducing the amount of requested money to seven hundred thousand dollars so that's that's where we are what do you look what do you so they've got two loans outstanding if correct I'm not they already mistaken. have a v, you already have a v cap loan. Correct. correct but it said the loans that you were paying off the the other the other loans please use had. the mic oh, sorry about that so the other loans that you had, when I added up what in your application it said you guys would be paying off and your annual amounts or quarterly amounts you were paying, it still was not consistent with the amount. So, so I just want to make sure that. So our goal, uh, and financially we feel we'll be able to meet that goal, uh, we have a current loan for a rehab for the tower ladder uh, that we plan to pay before the first installment for the engine loan would be due back to the state. Yes, we have a yeah. Correct. <laughs> Sorry. So yes, we have the, a rehab loan right now that's current uh, balance of $130,000. We have a tool loan that we have out that has a balance of about 85,000 as of two days ago. Okay. Um, and then we also have an, an ambulance loan out that's out there for $39,000. Um, with what President Perneski has said that yeah, our goal with the company is to try to pay those down before we go and take receipt of the, the engine in, is it two years, Todd? 2025. Correct, in 2025, that we're gonna pay those loans off so then we can go and roll into the new engine and hopefully at that point, everything would kind of stabilize in that way. But yes, and then starting in 23, we will have the VCAF tanker loan that we currently have out right now. Do you think that you'll have enough funds to cover that? Correct. Yes. Yeah, yeah, and it was one of those that after our discussions and we kind of went back to our board and, and said, okay, well, we, we're going to try to speed up, if you will, some of the loans. So some of the loans come due in four to five years, and we can cut those down to three or or closer. Um, then that's one of those that we're going to try to take that that hit, if you will, on our finances now, so then we can prepare for the new loan coming in the future. Okay. Any other questions? Mr. Chair, I'd yes. like to uh, make a motion to take the recommendation from the VCAF uh, for the Denton Volunteer Fire Company uh, with the, uh, the negotiation with the 20 down to 15 years uh, for $700,000. Motion by Robbie, second by Chip Jewell. Any further discussion? Hearing none, all in favor say aye. Aye. Any opposed, no? Motion passed unanimously. Mr. President, do you have any comments? So on behalf of Please use the mic. <laughs> Sorry. The, uh, on behalf of the Denton Volunteer Fire Company, I w wish to express uh, our gratitude. Uh, we do appreciate this. Um, again, with the economic times that we're in, um, you know, we're looking at interest rates increasing, and this is going to be uh, huge for us uh, to be able to uh, hopefully provide uh, outstanding service to our community so thank you all very much uh, we do greatly greatly appreciate it thank you
Treasurer, anything? I too would just like to say thank you so much uh, on behalf of the Den Volunteer Fire Company and President Berneski and his comments. So thank you, Maryland State Firemen's Association, uh, for everything that you guys do. Thank you, and thank you for attending. Certainly. Have a great day. Thank you, gentlemen. Have a, have a, you, you're, good. you're free to go if you wish. <laughs> <laughs> You can stick around. I have a. a, a Joe, Joe just doesn't like a, a bunch of suits around him. That's all. I thought that one boy was an FBI agent when he came in here. So. He was a little nervous. At, at, at any rate, a uh, couple of uh, good news that, that I got from uh, Scott Gordon over the past couple of weeks. Uh, the uh, I'll read his notes to me. Uh, the second VCAF loan to Early Heights for $607,123 was settled on 11 9. Uh, this is completed now. The $2,496,900 facility loan to Lisbon settled last week. Been a long time coming, but it's done. Uh, kudos to the Attorney General's Office, the, little, the attorney he got to work on this for free for VCAF. Uh, he says she did a yeoman's job, and it very well appreciated. Uh, uh, Maryland Department of Emergency Management received final payment from United Communities. Uh, the Department of uh, Military must process MVA lien termination statements for Morningside, Madero Springs, and United Communities. Uh, the Maryland Department of Emergency Management finally has gotten access to the Department of Military Loan software was restored. That was taken away with the merger and Scott's been in the dark for a year and a couple of months, but he finally worked very hard, diligently and got that taken care of. So now he has access to that process. And here's the one that surprised me more than anything else. The Maryland Comptroller finally transferred $1,116,871.57 from special funds from the Department of Military to VCAF. Accordingly, this new cash, the, the new cash balance is $11,956,847.49, but it also uh, accrued, uh, improved our cash balance to $4,972,864.49 that was available to lend before today. Uh, so now we have $4,272,864.49. Uh, that was of last month. I haven't gotten this month's report yet. Uh, so where that million one whatever came from, Scott said he's been working on that for several months and didn't, didn't look very promising, but he pulled his strings as what he can do, and it, it, it came. So nobody, I talked to several members of the committee that have been around a lot longer than I have, and they had no clue as to where that came from. Also, but it's good news. Yeah, that was, I said it was good news. <laughs> also spoke to him, uh, as has been discussed by the committee, that we probably after today have over about $3 million in funds that are now committed that cannot be used for anything else. <laughs> Our concern was what happened. He said, that money still earns interest until it is uh, checks are written. And the interest rate, he told me, and I wasn't aware of this, is uh, attached to the Maryland State Pension Fund. So that interest rate, he says, is fluctuates between 7 and 9 percent per annum. So that's what we get interest on our money in the, in the VCAF fund. I wasn't aware of that. I don't know if Joel was aware of that because that was originally set up, but that's happened. So kudos to Scott Gordon for all the hard work he's done in the last several months to, to get all this done. Can't say enough about the man. Also, uh, for those that care, uh, VCAF, our, our application period just opened on December the 1st. Uh, it will close uh, for new applications 12 February. Uh, last day to complete will be 1 March. Uh, on the 2nd, it will be submitted to the committee for review and scoring. Uh, the 12th of March will be our next meeting at a place to be determined. And April 1st, they've been told they will have to be at Flintstone for, for the executive committee. We're not meeting 
uh, anything between now and the holidays because new administrations take over and we realize that some companies may have a hard time getting signatures on documents that they need because a lot of these uh, officials change the first between between now and the first week of, of uh, January and uh, the holidays come too and it's a real short window so it'll be next meeting will be so we can be at Flintstone any questions okay chip Joe I don't know if you're aware but Tim Ganley suffered a very serious injury about a week ago um, week and a half he was in shock trauma he, mm -hmm. uh, from a fall he was supposed to come home this week and I don't know if Bob Jacobs knows anything more than I I think he was supposed to come home Tuesday uh, Thursday this past week but uh, but he did suffer a, a, a fall and a very serious injury he of course he's the representative for Frederick and Washington County so I don't know if you were aware of that I was not aware yeah. of that uh, but I'll, we'll keep him in our thoughts and prayers and I'll get a hold of Craig and I'm sure between him and myself anybody in Washington Frederick County need anything we can certainly pitch it and and do whatever we have to do so anything else Joel uh, Joe I just want to confirm we have 4.2 million to lend to lend to lend okay As of today and Joe's giving you the dates um, it's a benefit uh, and we've heard, just heard that there's an engine that they buy, they're buying $900,000. Obviously, we're all aware, painfully aware, the price is going up. Uh, so this is a great benefit we can provide. Uh, so get it out to your, your counties that this money is available. And, and the lead time to get these pieces of equipment is anywhere from 24 to 40 months. Or longer. Or, or longer, yeah. So the money's going to be tied up and... <laughs> And, and VCAF has discussed that, and we're not there, hopefully we won't get there, when we get to about a million dollars left, we're gonna have to take real hard looks because we need money in case somebody has a catastrophic incident that they need to either to buy a, re, a replacement uh, used piece or whatever. So, and I know those prices have gone up too, so, but. We're working diligently. That's why we negotiate with all the companies to reduce their amount and their terms. And they've been very receptive to us. So we thank them for that. And then on behalf of VCAF, wish everybody a happy holidays and anybody else. Mr. President. To Joe and the VCAF committee, thank you. What you just stated, I, I enjoy sitting at, at their VCAF meetings and the way they can wheel and deal with the various companies, whether it's the amount or the amount of years instead of a 20 year or a 15 or a 10. And kudos to Joe and the committee for how you can swing that. Thank you. Their next meeting will be at Ocean Downs this evening. <laughs> <laughs> wheel and deal, we're in. Uh, Thanks a lot. Thanks. Thank Any you. other questions? Thank you, Mr. President. Again, thank you. And thank you for that good news on additional money. Where so. it came from, nobody, I, I don't know. Don't answer Sounds it. great. <laughs> we'll take it. No problem. <laughs> Sandy, you want to come up? We're talking about money. Come on up. You have money. Hello, everybody. Um, I want to thank you for your. Do you just told me to stand up. Uh, I want to thank you for your donation. The winner gets Merry Christmas, two hundred and thirty dollars. So the winning ticket is six five one one four eight two. You. <laughs> six six five one one four eight two. So you. All right. <laughs> Doctor Chismar. Okay, I I got you. Can't you read it? You want my glasses? I'm sorry. What? Yeah, Doctor. 
Dr. Tim, stand up, Tim, please. You, you certainly, you certainly can. Thank you very much. You donated the two hundred and thirty dollars. Thank you. Now, Thank Steve, you, so you gotta much. match that though. <laughs> 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 oh, you're gonna reverse the challenge. <laughs> I like playing tennis. You, sir. <laughs> okay, for the picture. Two seven one. Seven two zero seven. No, I've got to check my tickets. Last two are two oh seven. Okay. Great. Chaplain Roth. You want to give the blessing, please. <laughs> Let us pray. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you for allowing us to gather here in this place. And as we continue this fellowship, we pray that you would bless the food that we are about to receive. We thank you, Lord, for the hands that have uh, made it and has, has, will be nourishing to our bodies. We ask that you will continue to bless us in this time and bless this food. In Christ's name, amen. We'll recess until 1 o'clock. Like to bring the meeting back to order, please. I do want to take a minute 
and thank all of you. Uh, it's been, been very nice this morning. You've kept the conversations down. We've been able to conduct business. Uh, really appreciate your support and uh, look forward to it this afternoon also. <clears throat> Recruitment retention, Jonathan Dayton. Executive Committee members. Just a few things to update you on um, this afternoon. The uh, the R and R committee did recently meet on November 22nd. Um, a lot of the uh, updates. I forgot Kate wasn't going to be here. I was going to allow her to do that. But um, first off, the MSA mentoring chip program um, is well underway. We did meet in College Park at Miffery to discuss the program itself, to go over any possible updates and edits to the program. The unfortunate thing was that there was very low attendance. Um, the Safer Grant coordinators were in attendance, myself and very few um, r and committee members. Um, uh, the only executive com committee member in attendance uh, was Joel McCray, and I thank Joel for being there. Um, with that said, uh, we did um, go over the program in depth. It's around 30 pages in length. One of the challenges that we foresee having with the program itself is the adoption of the program at the volunteer company levels. Um, we understand that uh, departments can choose to use our resources or not use our resources. Um, we really feel that a uh, conservative goal would be a 10% adoption rate of the program. While that sounds low, that's a very realistic number. So in order to roll it out effectively, one of the um, most promising things in the future that we have going for us is we've hired a social media and marketing manager under the SAFER grant. That is a quote unquote full-time position, although it's not classified as full-time. They are putting in um, around 40 hours a week um, as far as time commitment goes. One of the first tasks that we've assigned that uh, a new hire, who his name is Stephen Jenkins, and he actually lives in Allegheny County, is with um, putting together a marketing program around the mentoring chip program. So currently, we are in solicitation and RFPs out for companies that already have mentorship programs that have been successful, um, and doing some uh, interviews and some videos uh, associated with that program. In addition, um, Stephen has met with Kate and Heather, our Safer Grant uh, full-time coordinator, as well as myself for some additional tasks. One of those tasks is going to be overseeing, of course, all of our social media. We do have a presence on Facebook, Instagram, YouTube, Twitter, LinkedIn, and uh, TikTok. So there are a multitude of accounts. Previously, Kate and I did most of that management along with Richard Snader, and it, it is very time consuming. So having someone dedicated to overseeing our, our social media platforms on a full-time basis is very encouraging. Um, in addition to that, we will have some more analytical numbers to report at future executive committee meetings. Um, Stephen has uh, created some <coughs> tracking mechanisms for us to keep track of all of our numbers, to see how we are trending, as we know that social media is one of the biggest tools we have to our advantage currently especially when it comes to recruitment and retention. In addition to just uh, using him as a recruitment and retention tool, um, he is there and a disposable asset for the association itself. Um, so working with reaching the next gen committee, um, as well as to you know, further our mission as the MSFA, he is there to do that as well. Um, we did hire a Northeast uh, Regional Coordinator um, with the unfortunate passing of Skip. Um, the Safer Grant team did some reorganizing to hire someone for the Northeast region to take over that portion of the state, and we do have a new hire there. And of course, like I mentioned, Stephen is the most recent additional new hire. Uh, one of the most uh, recent tasks um, besides the mentorship program 
that has taken place here within the last few months is we did a guideline manual review of the program that the MSFA has. The uh, program is listed on our website. Um, it is about 40 pages in length, and it hasn't been updated for at least 10 years. I'm going to guess at least uh, about 20 years. Um, I appointed uh, a small ad hoc committee of the r and committee to review that manual. Um, there were three individuals that sat on that ad hoc committee. They did review the manual, made some grammatical recommendations as well as a few changes. The Safer Grant team is going to update the manual and then repost that onto our website. Um, I did not include any uh, statistical or, or analytical data in this report of the r and um, for the r and committee. Like I said, uh, future um, meetings, there will be some additional data to report from Stephen. Um, he has uh, already created a, um, some templates and guidelines um, for our Instagram page and some of our other um, work that we have been doing. And we'll quickly begin to uh, travel the state um, to begin recording um, some video videography shots for us as we continue in the future. And so with that, I'll end the R and R report and ask for any questions. Any questions? No questions. How about volunteer trumpet? Yes. While I'm here, uh, the volunteer trumpet. I'll keep it very brief. Um, I've said this for two years, three years now that you know the lack of um, submissions has made it very challenging for us to uh, put together a um, very important publication. So I do thank, though, everyone that has contributed, Chip being one of those individuals that has, you know, always contributed to the trumpet. So I thank you, Chip. Um, unfortunately, we've had a couple passing of uh, a couple members. One of them, I will be remiss to say, uh, Chief Jim Jarbo um, out of Montgomery County. Uh, Chief Jarbo um, was very instrumental in the uh, fire chief quizzes, as well as a lot of different sketches not only for the volunteer trumpet, but for the MIMS um, publication as well. So with that unfortunate passing, again, um, begins to create less and less material for the trumpet. Um, with that said, as a chairperson, we did take an initiative to utilize our new hire, Stephen, to change some of the uh, ways we are operating that trumpet. Um, the next edition that you will see, which will come out um, on the website in about two weeks, um, we'll hit the mailboxes in about two weeks as well, um, it has a brand new look. Uh, there is a brand new front page of the trumpet, there's a brand new insert page, there is a recruitment and retention um, section, which is brand new, so it's going to take a brand new look. Um, the intention of that look is to hopefully attract some younger readers as I can tell you that at least at one of the departments that I volunteer with, um, there might be a single reader um, out of that entire department. Unfortunate, but just kind of the truth of the publication. Um, so we're hoping to you know, increase the readership, um, change the you know, median age a little bit to incorporate some younger um, readers. One of the other additions to the trumpet that will be happening is some committee reports. So I've emailed some select committee chairs um, within the last two weeks that will be sending some new updates and reports from some very important committees of the MSFA, which will also be included in that publication. And again, with that, I will end the volunteer trumpet report and ask for any questions. Are there any questions? Okay, thank you. <coughs> Let's get back on schedule. Let's uh, do legislative. Good afternoon. 
The legislative report uh, was filed. Hope you all got copies of it. I'm not going to go through the whole thing. The highlights of it are um, we have been busy so far this year. We've been in Annapolis several different times, met with several groups. Um, as I outlined in my report, uh, one of the uh, we met with a governor candidate. He had reached out to the MSFA, wanted to meet with us about the fire service and how he, if he was elected, would have been able to uh, work with us and help us. At this time, we are working on getting a meeting with the governor-elect. Hopefully, we'll have one of those shortly. We also met with uh, Chairman Ben Barnes. A meeting was set up with him. He gave us about a half hour of his time. Very appreciative of that. He was very attentive to the needs of the fire service as far as funding goes and how his committee, the House Appropriation Committee, could help us. That was very, that was very, very positive. Um, one of the other things we've been working on that you've got in here is MACO reached out to the MSFA and the fire service, realizing we do have an issue with recruitment retention. They had an initial meeting with their representative at 17 State Circle. They uh, asking for some input on how they could work with us and how they could help us. The result of that, after a couple meetings, a couple rewrites, I left a copy of the latest draft legislation that was uh, just brought out yesterday morning. Uh, we had a meeting uh, yesterday, had a Zoom meeting yesterday, and this latest draft was discussed. Uh, we started off with a, commit, a, a proposed committee of about nine members. We went from nine to 11 and then expanded from 11 to 15. You'll see before you what the final draft looks like at this time. One of the, one of the things or a couple of the things that came out of it yesterday, uh, and again, this is after several different meetings. This is going through their legislative group right now. They're looking at it. They're going to ask that this be addressed as an emergency legislation so that it can take place quicker, get enacted quicker, and get funding quicker. It's got an accelerated um, time on it. Hopefully by the you know, 12 months from now, we'll have a committed report back ready for legislature. Every year, MACO has four primary um, areas that they're working in. The recruitment retention for the fire service is on their list of four for the next two years. So this, isn't a, this is not going to be a one and done situation. They're looking at this as a statewide issue and the fire service in general. It's going to cover not only our volunteer fire service, but since if you take a look at it, the people that do the recruiting is the fire service. Out of the fire service, uh, you're finding your EMS people. And, you're all, and the, the, the career side is actually seeing, uh, I'm going to go out here on a limb with a term, but we're probably the best recruiter they've got. A lot of the career service is coming out of the, uh, out of the volunteer service. So we're all in this together. It doesn't matter who we are, whether we're career or volunteers. It doesn't matter for EMS, rescue, fire. The program we're looking at here is going to help everybody. And the fact that they've reached out to us, they've made our situation of priority is a big step forward. Now we've, um, as far as our agenda for this year, we've met with the president's office. We've had other people come to us with some issues they'd like to see happen. I didn't include all of that in my report, but some of the bigger things that we've looked at, we had a partnership meeting in Crofton, and some of this was discussed. Um, we're looking at the income tax deduction that we've been after now for a couple years, taking it from where it's at now up to $10,000 a year. We're still moving forward with that. We've already started working on that. Hopefully to get it to 10,000 and incrementally up to 15,000. It's the same thing we were, we were after last year. Uh, a VCAF funding increase to increase that fund, not just what's coming back in, but to put more money into it. After hearing the report this morning, you know, Everything else has changed. This fund has not changed in several years. We'll try to get that back up. Another thing we're looking at uh, to prioritize this year is state money for um, 
physical exams for all of our firefighters. An annual exam, if we can get the money for it, we'll take what we can get, we'll keep pushing until we get it. It's a lot better as somebody, this was a quote, I didn't make this up, but somebody else made a statement during a meeting. It's a lot less expensive to spend $600 on a, um, a physical every year than it is to pay for a funeral. And without one, you're gonna have more of the other. And last year, we had some issues come up with some language with Portman's compensation and with some coverage issues. And we've got both of these broken down this year to be addressed again to try to get with the workman's compensation, try to get some language changes in there to protect the, the volunteer fire companies and also to get uh, uh, some other items readily recognized under presumption bill with some of the things that are happening at this time. That pretty much covers it without going into any other detail. Um, we'll have a report from Teresa on the name change. Uh, she's got quite a report here. I, I didn't get to read it all, but it's rather thick and lengthy. The last thing I'd like to be sure and um, mention is, I've stated it before, we are going to have a legislative reception this year. It's going to be January 24th. It'll be at the Calvert House, and it'll be uh, 1,700 to 1,900 hours, just like we've had it in the past. That would conclude my report, sir. Any questions of legislative? Buddy? The physicals, that open to all auxiliary members as well, or just riding firefighters? Language isn't there, but if you're, if you're with a fire company and you're working for the fire company, you should get a physical. Other questions? I got one. I mean, uh, uh, Robert, I think it would, what you're doing and your group is doing is great. There, there's a lot of moving parts. Um, coming forward and like I said we ha really have to get out with the new legislators and make sure that uh, they understand our concerns going forward and I think this group will do that um, and the one thing that we keep hearing even when Jonathan was up here is recruitment retention and that's paramount for what we do here I mean we bring a lot of folks in and you know I, I think it's great that if you have a volunteer and they wind up in a career service and um, and, and that's great. You know, we bring them in, we help them get a, a job and, and establish a good career. We're, we're doing the right thing. And folks ask me that all the time. Well, Eric, you know, they, we bring them in and then they go to the career side. Well, that's not a bad thing because um, we're going to get them back one way or the other. And, and that's positive. And as we go, continue to go forward, same way with their, the mentorship program, that gets tied into that. That was one of the big things that a lot of folks were asking about on the EMS side. Where are the mentors are to help me get to where I need to be? And it's just as important on the operational side. So as these classes for that develop and we continue to go forward, we still need to reach out to our coordinators that we're paying to help us do that. Um, the departments really need to reach out to these folks to help them. You know, look at what you're doing. If things haven't changed and you keep doing the same thing over and the end result is the same and nobody's coming into your door, you got to do something different. And that's what we're trying to do is to just have you take a different look about what we're doing to help you move forward. So just food for thought. Thanks very much. One of the things, if I could just add shortly, and I was discussing this with the uh, president just last night. What you just said with the new people coming in, they've got to know us and know what our, what our issues are. I'm not going to say problems. I'm going to say our issues. And one of the things that we're going to start working on right now so we're ready when, when the new session starts is we will have an invitation to our reception, a personal invitation for every member of the General Assembly. So we can walk in and speak to them, not the chief of staff, not the, the lady at the front desk we want to speak to each individual person and introduce ourselves as the Maryland State Firefighters Association we represent the volunteers and let them know that we are there introduce ourselves and get them to come see us and talk to us so we're going to start with that right now and go forward 
Any other questions? Okay, thank you. Teresa? Let him go? Okay, then federal legislation. All right. Well, first of all, uh, I met or met by uh, Zoom meeting with the new, <coughs> excuse me, NBFC legislative person. His name is Ron Woodward. He comes from the I Chiefs. And Ron and I uh, had a nice discussion for about a half hour about federal legislation, and he and I are. We'll be working closely together. It's one of the things that we agreed to at that meeting. So <clears throat> bring you up to date with that one. And uh, my report was filed, even though it was late, it was Thursday, because it was the last minute thing. The two first items on my report, Senate Bill 231 is the PFAS uh, Act. Uh, we're trying to get that passed before the end of the session, which ends December 31st, so they don't have to carry it over. So that's one of the bills we really need to get our people to uh, maybe get on and get this through, uh, through uh, you know, pass the House on the 29th of um, July, and now it uh, moved on to the Senate on the... Uh, uh, 11 uh, 30 the third yeah the 30th of November so we need to send it to get that done so we can get to the president and the other big bill is the uh, reauthorization uh, of the uh, fire grant and the safer act and uh, this reauthorization we go through to 2030 <clears throat> now we're two years behind so actually this would carry over to uh, 30. 2032 so we can get this done uh, like I say the bill passed the Senate this week and it's moved to the house and they're going to try to get it in the expedi expedient uh, uh, portion of the house so don't have to spend the time in the committee and a whole lot of uh, floor debate so if we can talk to our uh, uh, representatives and their senators over there to make sure it gets passed and, and gets to the president to sign before the session's over. Those are the two key things. The others I won't uh, really read about or talk about because they've been on, we've been working on them since back in, after the uh, August uh, executive committee meeting. So that's where we stand right now. But the key thing is to get these two bills through the through Congress to the president to sign so that we can have them and they don't have to go back and rewrite them and take them over. Uh, the other key bill is the Far Station Improvement Act that I know the president and all was at the press conference. That'll probably have to go back and I'm sure Senator Cardin and, and Van Holland will reintroduce that next year. So those are the key things right now. Any questions for federal legislation go ahead and do out of state yeah thank you um you got my written report the president pretty much covered that in his report uh we had a good turnout at the uh, delaware memorial and uh luncheon and i thank everybody for attending or letting me know that they couldn't attend so that we could keep delaware's costs down when it came to meals and stuff like that so i thank you there uh mm -hmm. They have not decided next year. I mean, their their dates, I think, is pretty much set in stone is the third week of uh, September. But they're not sure where they're going to be holding their convention. So we don't have any update on that yet. And the Pennsylvania uh, Firefighters Association uh, went together with the uh, Pennsylvania Fire In and Emergency Service Institute combined their meeting and they are reassessing that and seeing how that worked out and we have no update on what they're going to do next year so those two were the only ones i hadn't reported about at our uh, august meeting so uh, that's pretty much the out of state we're pretty much wrapped up until i guess uh, we go to uh, the uh, fire uh, csfi dinner coming up that's it any questions for out of state yeah one okay. other thing i have on uh, legislation uh, that i attached to you as you see um, 
this year an unfortunate report I sent to you was that is not correct as of yesterday unfortunately we lost another responder on the highway yesterday so um, we now have a total of 45 uh, responders that have uh, either been have been struck and killed on the highway the latest one was a tower that was struck on uh, the 2nd of December yesterday so that brings the total to uh, 16 towers 15 law enforcement officers uh, one safety service patrol, nine fire EMS personnel, and four road service technicians. The other thing we have, and this is from Cumberland Valley, I uh, got cards back there. On the back of it is a new website for anybody that's involved in a near miss or, or struck by. We'd like for you to go to that webpage, fill out the form that's there. It's all, most of it's all drop down stuff. And there's nobody collecting that information on near misses or struck bys. So Cumberland Valley has started that. They're working with Federal Highway. And uh, we get that statistic, so we'll help prove and then get money to continue to be able to educate the uh, driving public about uh, the move over and slow down law. And, that, and I hope everybody understands that as of October in the state of Maryland, our law changed. So anytime you come upon a vehicle in the state of Maryland, no matter what kind of vehicle it is, you be in your own personal car, you have your four-way flashers on, you got to slow down or move over. That's the new law in Maryland. So, and we have, uh, I have literature here about D drivers, if anybody would like to have some of them to pass out and send around. So we're staying on top of that and trying to educate the driving public so any help can be would be appreciated thank you and that's good that you reiterated that just keep it in everybody's mind any questions hold on Teresa 17 state circle oh, hey. Frank anything I do my normal every other week call to Maryland state government. Um, the last time, and I think I reported this, the last time the lady I had been dealing with all of a sudden was reassigned. And the lady didn't seem happy about the whole deal. So anyway, a couple weeks ago I got back on the phone to the head guy. And he got a three-way with the number two lady. And she said that they, <laughs> all right, here we go. Well, he, she said, well, Mrs. Rucci is still working on that project. Well, actually, after I wrote my report, I actually got a thing for a resolution of a lease for an LLC form that came the other day. I filled it out, shipped it back, and haven't heard a damn thing since. Did it go to the number one guy, the number two lady, or this the number three? This guy's in charge of the whole friggin', the whole friggin' thing. So, but they're not throwing us out. It's there. And the weird thing is, is the lease is dated July of this year. So, and it's a five year instead of a two year. It still has to go in front of the Board of Public Works. Sometime. Frank, I never heard anything more today except the insurance information well, we sent. the insurance was two months, three months ago. I know, I know. We never heard any more back. I guess they accepted it? Well, yeah, they have, I haven't heard nothing back. Okay. And the unique thing is, is I was talking last week to the Assistant Secretary of State and I asked him, when is Maryland going back to work? He says, I don't know. I'm working from home today. <laughs> Any questions for Frank? <laughs> Mark, I think you talked fire books before, but anything else? Uh, no, until we get this straightened out, the fire marshal is going to do some checking to make sure. But our understanding is now that it's emergency legislation, it should be enacted uh, immediately. There's still a concern about delivery of the books. Uh, we no longer have the location at the uh, Crofton office to deliver the books and hold them there for distribution. So you and I have spoken about a possibility that we're working on. But the goal is that we can every do that. 
Okay. The once everybody is in office, sworn in, then I'll reach out to the publisher and start the process of the name, updating all the names and information, and doing the legislative search, get the book put together, proofed, and then printed at that point in time. <coughs> Any questions for fire law books? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Teresa, you're up. Well, hello, everybody. So um, just to bring an update, um, we had 664 emails that were sent out to presidents, chairman of delegates, officers, you name it, and only 260 people responded to the survey. The report reflects every response that was submitted per each question asked. If you had any questions, please let me know. The next steps will be conducting a town hall meeting with two in the north and the south parts of the state for in person. Now I'm looking at, I've already, uh, Branchville and Bel Air have confirmed, so I greatly appreciate those. My um, concern is, and as everybody has talked about, I've heard from many people, the voting process. And I have to have that rectified before I have these town halls, in a sense, because I don't want open-ended questions there. I want to be able to go into that meeting with all the information so that when someone asks, we all don't stand around going, well, well we didn't think about that, or we have to think about that, or we're still working on that. Um, we need to hear from our membership. It's important to hear from our membership. But when you have sent up 664 emails in response to this and only 260 people felt their input was necessary or they, they responded, which was great, um, I have all those other people that did not want to respond. Now, I don't know if that's because they didn't like the process or they didn't, um, they just felt like this is another way for us to I've heard people complain to me. I've had people pretty much yell at me. I've had people say some pretty negative things to me. And I'm like, well, you know what? I'll take those comments. Uh, I'm okay with that. You all ask me to do something, I'm gonna do that. But I come back to that person and say, you know what? I ask for you all to help us all the time, but I don't ever see you in Annapolis. I don't ever see you at a fire prevention meeting. I don't ever see you all here. So if you're that vested in a name change or don't want the name change, why are not more people at this meeting? Why is it the same people every time at this meeting? Because we care. That's our, that's our thoughts. But when I have people pretty much, well, I can't cuss, um, say things to me in a very negative way, I'm fine with it. I do know that political aspects are behind this on some people. Then I've had some people send me emails saying, you know, I already voted in Ocean City, I'm not voting again, this is stupid. Well, okay, we'll fill out the survey. Fill out the survey. It's 10 questions. And really you didn't have to do all 10 questions. You were broken down by series of questions. So, and the next step would be to have Zoom meetings and options for those people to have that town hall. And ultimately, the data that I collected is 25 pages long. Um, I don't think people read the questions very well because obviously I'm asking if, did you agree with the name change? Some people are like, why would I answer that question? Okay, well, just, I, I just need a yes or no. Very simple. So I've gone and I started looking at more at the different things. And really, ultimately, of the 260 people that responded, um, so everybody hears it. The, um, it was sent to past presidents, chairman, delegates, and all the membership was able to answer these questions. So really, it went out to other core groups and then people sent it out to other people, but I only got 260 responses back. So for the first question, did you vote for the MSFA name change? I had 89 people respond back saying yes. 123 people voted no. And if they were applicable member response only, only 48 people, that was where if you weren't a chairman of delegates or a president. And then the second question was, if you voted no for the name change, possible reasons why should it not change? A, 
B, outside influences. C, names that appeal to me and nothing is applicable. So A, should, not, should the ni name not change, was 102 people submitted. They do not want the name to change. B, outside influences, only 31 people felt that that's where it was coming from. C, eight people said the names don't even appeal. And D, 20 people said nothing was um, what they wanted. Question three, did you have an additional name that you would like to uh, have the task force respond to? That's where you get all these different answers. And ultimately, when you go back into all the aspects, they looked at the Firefighter Association as the name that they would see the most. That's where people wanted a name. Now, I asked what the name should be, and still people wrote really lengthy comments about why it shouldn't change. I was asking you what the name wanted to be. So that's where we were on that. Got a lot of those. Keep going. Question four was if you answered yes to any of the followings, which name did you choose? Maryland State Firefighters Association, Take Volunteer Fire Rescue, EMS Association. So I had 100, 108 people responded to this question. The association name again for Firefighters Association was 55 um, votes for that. Um, 28 people wanted the Fire and EMS Association and 26 people requested Maryland State Volunteer Fire Rescue and EMS Association. Question five is, why did you choose this name? Answer, well that's very lengthy and you all have seen the report. Um, I, I'll gladly send it to more people and I plan on giving this to Jonathan so that it can go out into the trumpet so that people can see it there too online. Um, and then the member section was number six, which is I'm not a past president or a chairman of delegates, and I wish to vote and submit the following. 184 people responded with, yes, they agree that a name should change. 53%, 53.8% requested a name change. Um, I'm sorry, I read the wrong one. I'm sorry, 42.4% wanted the name change. 53.8% wanted, they did not want the name change. Um, some agreed with the name change. They, rec they, they agreed with what we recommended as the firefighters. And then some people wrote in, um, it really doesn't matter, change or no change. So stuff like that. And that's all attached to it too. And then the set, uh, question seven was, please state why you feel the name needs to change. I had 83 people respond to this. It says, one of the major things was we need to move from the 1960s and market ourselves to what we are, which includes fire and EMS. Anything short of not including EMS in the name would be crying shame. Um, one person wrote, it is time for the MSFA to surpass the World War II era and start accurately representing the fire and EMS workforce of today. Additionally, the way to process this was to handle last go round was a complete joke. I sincerely hope that the current leadership find a productive way to move forward with a collaborative solution that does not make this entire, the entire Maryland Fire Service look bad. So that is why I need certain questions asked before I have a town hall meeting. Items like this are very concerning to me. And it's, it's the process of having that voting challenge, I really think is where we need to be. I also asked that the last time the name change first came about, we created a document. Yes, I was told one page, but I can't do one page with these questions. It was three pages. And it gave you all the outlines that you needed to follow as a, an executive member that you could go and talk at your respective departments and counties. But when you go to a county association meeting after you've worked really hard to make sure that this stuff is done and that person doesn't even utilize what you gave them and then it doesn't even get put out that way, that's a little disheartening to the committee. So I find that kind of stomach, sometimes a stomach on me. But when I create something, I really request that you all are sharing this. It's there for a reason, okay? 
So that, that's the type of things that we're looking forward to. I have talked to Kate. I have some drafts that I'm going to show her that we can make sure that we meet the criteria of what we need to do. Moving this forward, whatever we need, is important. I do know that the voting issue was brought up again to me uh, just a couple of days ago when I was told, hey, I'm the chairman of delegates. I never got my stuff. I'm like, hold on, let me go through the list. What was given to Kate was given to me. We did not cut and paste anything. I just took the information and moved it forward. Those people were completely missing. Now their chairman of delegates was missing, but their president and their chief got it. So I said, well, could you go back to your chief and ask, or the president and ask if he got the survey? Because it was cut and pasted to him. But my concern is, um, it was John Bender. John Bender said, hey, I voted in Ocean City. I'm like, are you sure you voted in Ocean City? Did you get five things? Well, the list that I received was he was omitted. So that, that was concerning to me. So I really, and I know Doyle and I have talked to, and I know that Ronnie and I have talked to, and I jokingly said paper ballot is the way I want to see it. But we have to come up with some kind of situational process, program, computer, or whatever, to make sure that these people feel comfortable for what we're doing. Because one minute I'm being told, I'm saying this is how we're voting in Ocean City, because this is what I was told we were doing. And then secondly, I'm coming somewhere else, I'm going, that's not what was discussed. Where is the disconnect? I don't know. So ultimately, um, I want to do the town halls as much as we can, but I need certain things answered. And I really think the push of those obstacles need to be fixed first before we can have our people come to something and say, okay, here it is. And then I also want to say, I take a lot, like, I, I don't care, you know, you, you give me something, I'm going to do it. But uh, I'm not going to do it half-assed. I'm going to do my best as what I need to get it done. But some of these presidents, whew, I don't know how y'all do it. Because, um, yeah, I, I don't think they like me anymore, but I really don't care. I'm not here to make a friend. But I can tell you right now, this is what this states they're asking for. So of the people that voted, it is what it is. But the thing is, the process was convoluted. And some of the comments that are read in here are frustration. And you can read it and you can see it. And then you have some people that are trying to backdoor what we're trying to do, or not wait. Yeah, I know that we wait, we ask for everybody to submit, don't wait until January. But if you don't do it right, and you don't do a, be a part of it, or help me, or do whatever, and use what I'm trying to give you as the tools and resources to educate our members, it's gonna fail again. It really is. So, Ultimately, I have a lot more work to do, but I need some things done before I can move some of this forward. And, and, and I know that they wanted to get the town halls done right away, but there's, there's no way. Like stomachling, I'm like, that I can't, because that's a major roadblock. Because they're already pissed off at us. I, I don't want to make them mad even more. So there it is. Discussion, comments? Questions? Comments? Buddy, go ahead. A couple of things. Teresa. Yeah. Teresa? Yeah, buddy. Still can? Yeah. Breaker 9, Breaker 1-9. No. Okay. Teresa. Teresa. Good hey, buddy. Leadership is not easy. <coughs> Everybody in this room knows that. You're an outstanding woman doing some outstanding work. This is a huge challenge that we're all faced with. A lot of people have been doing this a long time, a lot longer than me. This is a big thing. People are frustrated. People were frustrated with the voting. People were frustrated the way it was put. All the work you're doing. So it's going to take time. Keep moving forward. We're going to get through this. Um, so a question I have. Have we figured out how to do the balloting for next year? That, As, that's what's being worked okay. on right now. Because I can understand when you go to these town hall meetings, that could be one of the questions. 
Yeah, and I because that's going to be we're going to write continue. So we need to really nail that down. I know there's people working on it, but we really need to nail that down. I support the town hall meetings because that conversation is out there, mm -hmm. whether it's virtual or it's in person, and we're going to get there. It's going to take some steps, but Teresa, leadership is not easy, and we're going to get through <coughs> this together collectively. Thank you. Any other comments? Yes. Go ahead, Doug. When the Strategic Planning Steering Committee met on November 22nd on the Zoom, the following people were there. Myself, Chip, Kate, Ron, Joel, Teresa, Lynn, Eric, Benny, and Bob Phillips. At one point, at the point of open discussion, voting procedure slash registration came up and we identified the issue of who registers their company, then who is going to be chairman of the delegation to vote. And we identified two personnel within MSFA who handle this. Doyle Cox and Rick Hemphill. I would ask Doyle to make your way forward <clears throat> or at least get to a microphone. And if you would, identify, Doyle, please, the process that I just described. The registration of companies as opposed to the registration for chairman of delegation responsible for voting. Who does what? Because before you get started, they've identified that names were missing from one list, but they showed up on this list. Uh, how, how can we get around this? And uh, No, I'm not getting around it. How do we get rid of this? Well, first of all, let's start off with uh, who has the power to submit the delegates and so on. Okay. Your local companies, they fill out the registration form. They fill out the credentials. All the information is taken from there. The credentials, uh, I'm sorry, the delegates, um, some companies vote on them. Some companies, the president uh, selects them and uh, says, okay, this is going to be the delegate, this will be the chairman. Uh, that's at the company level. We have no control over that, who they send in. Now, once the sheet comes in, Okay, it's uh, put together, and the list of the ones that have submitted credentials. The chairman of the committee and the president is sent on to, uh, last year it went to Rick. What he does with it from there, I cannot answer. Don't you think that's part of our problem? Oh, I think so. That... No disrespect to you or Rick. You guys don't know, you're not sharing information or the information that is shared is improperly uh, I, I put in a computer. I can't say that no information is shared. The information that I receive is shared, sent to him directly. Okay. Now, uh, from as I say, what he s submits or how he handles that from the, that end, I don't know. You know, because he is he's the one that's uh, now when they, a person comes to the ocean to register again. Okay, he changes some of the information. What he changes, I don't know. Yeah, this person's not going to be here. This one's not going to be here. Whatever. 
he changes it to who uh, comes in there and says, okay, uh, this person will be uh, voting. Is so, that even legal? Can you do that? Can we make changes to a submission by someone who is registered? I believe a letter from the president has to come to the secretary's office stating, I'm no longer available to come as the delegate or the chairman of the delegates. This is my stand in. And it has to be sent to the secretary's office. Prior to any registration. Yes. Well, you come to Ocean City. Well, let's back up. Yeah. yeah. The, um, in the previous years, that has been the practice of, okay, if you're going to change somebody, the president of the company is the only one's authorized to do that. Sounds pretty I, cut and dry to me. I would suggest that uh, we make a special announcement or a special mailing and send that to all presidents and remind them. That can be added into the registration package. Yeah, the, it has not. The problem, the problem that I see, you add it to the registration packet. The packet comes in. Oh, this is what I had last year. Here, fill it out. Right. That's Understand. Why I believe a special mailing or a special announcement needs to go to all the companies. companies. Yeah. Can I ask this? This is what I've been thinking of also. When he, when he gets the registration list closer to the end of like say May, cut a date off in May, give it to the executive people, the committees, and say okay, here's Southern Maryland, verify all these people and get back to me. Ooh. Well, I know that, but like you think, because we go into June, at least by that first of June, you'll know this is what was turned into me. Can you verify? Because if it's wrong, like okay, Montgomery County, the, they they spelled their name wrong. That was one of the people that yelled at me. But then it's like, sorry, buddy. But um, the guy when he went through the thing, I read back his email. He goes, "That's not my email." I'm like, "Well, who submitted it? That was the secretary submitted. They submitted the wrong email." Well, let's back up, Teresa. The, we have no control on the individual departments who submits anything. Now, a lot of the departments will wait until the X hour. You know, I can get more. Matter of fact, I've already started getting uh, credentials in for next year which I haven't even sent out yet saying you need to do this, this, and this um, because it, yeah, some people are ahead. But the credentials start coming in, uh, maybe one here, one there, right on through up until April. Then that's when the group of them come in from, um, you know, May, June. Is it a computer-generated list or is it them handwriting it? Then we no, have it's all computer. computer? Okay. Everything is computer. And of course, you have you have a half a dozen or so that are uh, I don't know how to use a computer. Okay. And yeah, they submit it. And Teresa, I applaud the idea that you had. That might be easy for me in Hartford Cecil with 25, 26 companies. But with 52 or some of the other representatives, that, that's a challenge. We, we've got to flush this out a little so, bit more. So when they go to Ocean City, I don't know. I register as a chairman. They ask me my name. I give my name. I walk away. But for a department, I've never registered for a department. So I, that's one thing I don't understand. So that person's verifying. What are they being told? Do you know? I have no idea. Yeah, that's Mr. Chairman. Oh. Tim and then Mitch. That was part of the problem, Teresa. You went in and you registered your department. They did, didn't make it clear enough to a lot of people that you had to go over here and register a second time to vote. Wait, what? That's yes. correct. Yes, that's, that's been my whole problem with this whole process was 
Yeah, big, for, for years and years, I, when I went down, I registered Potomac Fire Department. I went up, gave them my name, they checked me off, gave me my bag, and yeah, I was good. This past year, in order to vote, I had to register in my department, then turn around and go to another spot and register again so that I would receive the ballot for the election. And, and well, yeah that, that, yeah, that was all in there. But I had to go to two places. I had four departments I know of for sure that didn't know that. I sent them back and said, go to the next person down and make sure that you register with them so that you can vote. But just because you walked up and registered your department did not, did not guarantee you that you were registered to vote. But this is, I brought this up, the executive committee meeting after Ocean City, that this was a, this was a huge issue and it needed to be fixed two days after the convention in June. This needed to be looked at then and fixed. The, uh, Are you responding to him? Yes. Okay. Under what I understand about this, and of course, yeah, I don't know all of it because he hasn't uh, shared everything with me, but the reason that the second person or second registration was held in Ocean City was that uh, he had, by the bylaws, you had to be in Ocean City to vote. How he handled that, I'm not sure. Because he... Right. For what reason, I had no idea. Um, if you look back two years during the pandemic, Okay, we had a very smooth operation for his registration. You know, individuals, and I know Richard Brooks is going to chime in. <laughs> but the way the, as I say, way the uh, registration was handled was they submitted their credentials. All the information was gathered sent to the computer person, um, Mr. Wood, who generated the ballot. People voted by the email, and it was over with. Went very smooth. We didn't get that. We didn't test it this year. We were never given the ability to test this prior to the city either. That's another one. Right. Okay. That's another. Okay. Mitch? And then Bobby. Okay, using Jarrettsville as an example, Ben and I have been a, attending. This is we just completed our 50th convention this past year, both of us. Sometimes he was chair of the convention, or the delegation. Actually, most of the time he was. I I was the one who's done the voting for the last 48 years. He would do it. Sometimes I would do it, but he was chair. That's part of the problem because only the chairs got it. There was no consistency. In other words, it was open. If you were listed as one of the five delegates, you could go up at voting time and get your vote and go. And, and I strongly, my opinion is, we need to get back to how we did it two years ago, get back to the paper ballot, let it go through the Scantron. Because part of the problem was, I think, technology is good when you advance, but I still say 5% of the time we need to stay where we are because when we, had, when we advance some things, and this is one of them, it just doesn't work. I mean, we, co we create problems with it. And we go back to the way it was, and that, that will solve the problem that you have to be in Ocean City because you have to be there in order to vote. You can't be in Garrett County, you can't be in Ocean City, well, Ocean City, but you can't be in Southern Maryland and, and be allowed to vote. Bob Phillips. Yes. Can you keep it down, please? This is very important. First statement, we're not going to fix this today. It's not going to be fixed. But we need to know the issues at hand. Tim brought up a very good issue. And I was going to bring up the same thing. And it wasn't just you had to go to two places. When you walk up and tell a person your name, they ask you to spell it, you spell it, and they can't find it. 
and they look and they look and they look and they tell you you're not in here our second vice president at the time I don't know how long it took you to finally get registered and before him three more people so we're shooting ourselves in the foot right from the very beginning go ahead sir no I, I think that when folks do their registrations and when they do it online and they register at their apartments and stuff some of the issues where folks couldn't even spell their name right that that's part of it uh, you know I, I'm sorry I, I can't spell your name we didn't I didn't fill your your delegate form out or your email um, some of the other issues that we had that when you put your email in that email was going to someone else your spouse your boyfriend your girlfriend or whatever uh, I don't know why you can't get your own email we can go online and do all kind of shopping stuff and get that right but we can't get our own email so I mean that's not our fault you know when you submit your email we're thinking that that email that delegate is going back to that individual who signed up that's what the reasonable expectation is not that it's going to my company's president or to the chief when I register that part is that onus is not on us that's on the department if that's where your emails are going to that's probably where your your uh, voting form went to to wherever that whom email was that's not our fault so you know when you do your registrations and do your delegates it needs to go back to the individual who you put on the list that's where it needs to go and then if there's a change in my opinion if you're coming to Ocean City and you earn on that original list, you bring your, your uh, letter from your president to say, I'm changing this individual, here's who I'm voting for, so we're, and it verifies that you're that person in Ocean City. So whether you do it by paper or do it electronically, it's the same. I'm showing you that I am here to receive the information, whether it's electronic or paper. Now, what we had asked prior to going into Ocean City, which did not happen, and I'm still not very happy with that, that that was supposed to be tested and sent out to the executive board and the leadership here before we got to Ocean City, and that did not happen. And I'm still not happy with that. None of the presidents are hap happy that that did not happen. So we were testing the system before we even got there. So yes, there are some things behind the scenes that are ongoing that we are working on to try to make that a more fluid registration process. The other thing that we hear is there are too many people when you come into the convention hall that we can't hear. And if we separate people out, we tried that once before, that didn't work. And because everybody piles in there over that two day period to try to get registered and people can't hear. So, Again, we're trying to rectify that and how we can make sure that when you show up to register that we got the right person, you got the right name, you got the right email, here's who your president or chief sent in to be your voting delegate. So regardless of whether it's paper or electronic, it shows that you're present in Ocean City. That's our goal. Now the rest of the stuff coming behind it on the name change that's going to play out the way it's going to play out move, move that forward one way or the other whether it happens this year or next year it's not going to go away you know we're quite sure of that if it doesn't happen on Ben's watch you know when I toss my hat and run run the day it will probably fall in my lap and if it doesn't fall in mine it's going to fall in a skip so this ball is going to keep rolling down the road until there's a resolution it'll be year after year after year after year so we need to make a decision one way or the other on whatever the name's going to be. Who knows what that is? But we can fix the voting part of it, you know, and we're in the process of doing that. Between you and Rick, we need to sit down, you know, whether we put everybody in a room and go at it for a while to make sure that we got the right process, paper or electronic, one way or the other, and when people submit their names and their delegates, they need to verify it and make sure that it's right. That's not our fault. I hear what Teresa's saying. That's not her fault. I, I've heard it too going across the state. Uh, it's not my fault that you had your email go to your, your significant other or to your president. That's not our fault. Mr. 
Mr. What, Bobby. What, what I was getting at was this. Thank you very much. Be good. He, he was getting very frustrated. <laughs> and I was getting, it was getting painful just watching. My point being this, we're not going to fix this, but it's got to be fixed. And I would ask that the chair just consider one thing at this time. I don't know who has to fix it. I, I'm, I'm not that smart. When it comes to being a pencil, a point's been wore down, the eraser's gone. So my point would be this. Can this committee charge a task force, I don't know, the secretary, whoever, you got to make progress on this, and we need quick re resolution. I ain't going to wait until February to come bring it up again. Teresa needs some answers now. Can, can, this, can this committee form, have, have a task force form to address this and get back to us in X time? Because we're not going to do it today, but we can talk about it all day. I think the president's going to address it. Bob, to answer your question, uh, I met with Rick Hemphill and with Ron also through the convention committee, and they told me that they would have a program by January to try out and for it to be out for us, the executive committee, to look at. That's what Rick has, had told me a couple of weeks ago. But yes, I basically told Rick Hemphill and Ron at the convention critique that we had at West Annapolis back in August, we need to fix this. This was a Charlie Foxtrot of major proportions. Major. I went to Baltimore County's meeting at Rosedale and Doug, how many delegates said they never got their email? Period. Or, or, or they got it after the election was over with. There was a deadline time of, I believe, 1,700 hours. People were getting their notification at 1710, 1720. So what I'm looking at, Bob, what I charge them is this is my goal, whether it becomes reality, is a bank of laptops. Bob, you come in. Bob Phillips, Rescue Company, Cambridge. You're the chairman. You press in maybe your email address or whatever number you put in. The ballot comes up, bip, 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 sent. That's all I'm asking those guys to do. It's got to be simple. Jesus, if we can send people to the moon, we should be able to vote online. You know what I'm saying? Uh, you know, when they sent them to the moon, they used a slide rule, too. They didn't have a computer. <laughs> but you understand what I'm saying, Bob? I want to keep it simple. You know, because I know Teresa and some of oh, let's go back to paper, you know. But I want it because my thing is, my thing is, it keeps the delegates in the convention hall. You know what I'm saying? Like how we used to. If we have that room, have a bank of 20, 25 laptops, the delegates come in. The delegates can vote, and like Mitch was saying, whether you vote, whether I vote for Jarrettsville, it's immaterial. We're on that list. Right. You were given, you were given a, a code to log in. Your, uh, log in. That's my goal, Bob. That's all I can tell you. Ben, you did it better this time than last time I heard it. <laughs> Chip, you have comments. Just one quick comment that came up at the uh, Strategic Planning Committee to help eliminate the problem right at the beginning is simply when the credentials are sent in, the emails are there, you get a little message that says you've submitted your credentials, but send an email out, out automatically. And if it's the person's the chairman, then the email out, and the email goes out that says you are the chairman, you are responsible, automatically. Because, and then it also verifies that in fact the credentials were accepted because last year, I did mine in January and I'm on the nasty gram in February saying so I did new credentials. And Doyle had several of them that didn't show. So it would provide not only a verification of the email address, but also a verification that the credentials were accepted. Today, when an email, rather, I'm sorry, today when you submit your credentials, 
Um, I receive a copy of your credentials along with you will receive your credentials have been submitted. Now, if for some reason that they do not go through because you did not fill in one section or one blank or whatever, it will come up and indicate to you that you missed this part. Go back and check it. You know, in so many words, that's what it says. After I get it, half a dozen or so, I've always run back, put them together, run them back, saying, okay, you know, as a test message. And that's all I'll put in there. The email address, test message, sometimes they go through, sometimes they don't. Tim? We've given her a job to do, and we've just sat here for the last 45 minutes and found out that it's confusing as hell. It was that way last year. That was part of the problem with the process last year. We went into Ocean City with, this is how we were gonna do things. We got, the, we got there, and then we changed, and then it was like, what do we do? Uh, and then to be right down honest with you, I had no freaking clue what we did or how we were gonna do it. We identified six months ago, six months ago that we had this issue with two different places and balloting and all that stuff. And hopefully, seven months later, maybe, maybe eight months, we'll have something to look at. There's no way at this point that you're gonna be able to do this and make it not as confusing or less confusing than what it was last year. I mean, unfortunately, I'm not, I'm not trying to be the devil's advocate. I think Buddy was right in what he said. It's, it's hard. But just in what I'm hearing today and, and looking at this, I mean, you've got about 50%, 50-50 that said they'll do a town hall you know, type meeting. So that kind of that makes me wonder whether they're interested when, it, when it's like you know, almost 50-50. But we've sat here and discussed for 45 minutes this, this process that we identified six months ago. So we're not giving her a snowball's chance in hell and making this thing work. You can't, you can't do a town hall without the proper information to give it to the people. We need to know who's registering and who's the ballot, who is a chairman of the delegation to get a ballot. This is what it's going to look like. Okay, Doyle. You know, over a couple of years, um, Mr. President had the, has a good idea, and it'll work. So all we got to do is get it through to some people's um, process, and uh, it will work. Put the 50, 25, 20, whatever computers in one room. Simple program, go in there, click on it, vote, and you're finished. Any other discussion on this topic? Ron Block. Ron Block. I agree with what's been said, and I think the opening line, if we have a, a meeting in person or a town hall uh, on, online, you need to be able to say, A, the integrity of this voting system has been corrected. It's in place. We're not going to have any problems like we had last year with the late ballots going out. And this is how many times you've got to register when you get to the convention register your station and then register your vote however we do it we need to tell them that up front because there was a lot of confusion last year about the, the second needing to re the requirement to register a second time and maybe if you're going to send out an email in advance of this stuff that would be in there as well R remind your delegates you have to register twice register your station and then register to vote thank you any other discussion Robbie, what's what's our timeline? Are we going to put a timeline on this? Because we've sat here for an hour now. We need to put a timeline today as a executive committee. I, I, I think we need to. I we, think we need to do it sooner, Mr. President. You you have a goal. It's our job to make it happen, and we need to make it happen now because we're going to be another six months, and the convention is going to be here. We have to stand our ground and make this happen. I would say by January 15th. 
I, but, I will work with the presidents and we'll set a goal of January 15th. Yes, sir. Will we have a follow-up executive committee meeting on the 15th? We'll have a special meeting. Thank you. I mean, we've I've, been... Hey, I'm not afraid to call a special meeting. It, it, you know that. It, it's <laughs> terrible to say we spent six months and now we're going to try to jam everything into six weeks. Right. Well, my, I, I guess that's the world today. I have no idea. Again, my, my racer's gone. Steve. Well, and just a second. Uh, and, and also, I think as you've seen, we try to keep everybody informed of whatever the occurrence is or the event is, and we are definitely going to stay on top of this and, and keep you informed. Mr. President, I'll get you, Randy. Teresa made the Google survey. We all made it through that. Why can't we have a frickin' ballot that we can vote on? That simple. You know what I'm trying? It, it, it's not that difficult, ladies and gentlemen. It really can't be. That if we can do that survey that she created, why can't we have a ballot made? Randy? Use the mic. I know you passed yours on, but we've got to get this recorded. This is important. Unless I'm missing something here, I think um, communication is missing. And I'm saying as far as uh, the problem, the main part of the problem is that the intake area, those people are not here, and we're having this big discussion. So. If we meet it between now and the 15th, they need to be in the room. Mitch? One quick comment. One quick comment. We just all did this on November the 8th in the general election. So the program is there. Doyle? The, um, yeah, they was, Ron gave me some type of, uh, Please stay with us. This is an important topic. Doyle. The program was out of reach for us cost-wise. However, we have been talking to and working with uh, Dennis Wood on writing a easy program as uh, the president has indicated. So we'll go from there. Bob? Yes, just one question. I understand we're trying to determine how we're going to vote. Part of the issue is going to be the ballot itself. Because that, that was as confusing as anything was last year. We started off saying we're going to do A, B, C, D. Then we determined, well, we're going to take out D and we're going to put E in here, but we've got to have an F because E doesn't cover A. And we were all on the same page after we had all these meetings. And we get to Ocean City, and in 24 hours, it changed again. So I think it's a two-pronged problem. How are, how are we going to get our people registered to vote, and then how are they going to vote? Are we going to have a, multi, a multiple-step um, process that A is going to trigger B and B is going to trigger C? Are we going to have... You got to have 60, 66 and two thirds percent of this, or we don't move to that. Or if you don't reach 50 percent, it all goes up in smoke. And I'm just, I'm, I'm making a little bit of fun of there. Um, up one second. Please keep it down. When I can't hear, I know you can't hear. Go ahead. So I mean, I'm just, I, I, we, we've got two issues. We had a confusing ballot, and we had a confusing way to register the ballot. And I think both of these need to be addressed. One of them is our people deciding how we're going to use a program that does exist or does not exist. And the other one's going to be, and the parliamentarian I'm sure has got a lot to say about this, and he should have, rightfully so, how are we going to design our ballot this year to be a little less confusing? And with that, my closing statement is I won't have one. But I hope we don't get our voting programs from the state of Arizona. <laughs> Any other comments or discussion? Dave Lewis, past president Lewis. I, 
I, I think the president has the right idea. Um, you know, whether it be paper, or whether it be electronic, but hold it, hold it there. I mean, the problem is we try to make it easy for everybody and allow people to use these things to vote. And the fact that I got five, in my case six, because I got one as passed, I got six emails, so I had to vote six different times, it only made it further confusing. So, you know, if we go in the room where you, where, you, where, you, where you register, you get a little card that says your ID code is XYZ123, and you punch that in, and you go in and you do your five votes for your, for your department, whatnot. Uh, paper, I, I don't trust paper, because uh, the day after election, I thought I had a new county executive, but then the paper ballots came in, and, and, <laughs> and, 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 and now, I got, now I got the damn incumbent I have to worry about, but, but that, that, we, that we tried to get out. But, um, you know, I, I think the electronic will work, but I think we tried to make it easy for folks last year by, by doing it this way that says you could be at Secrets, you could be at Cork Bar, you could be wherever you wanted to be, as long as you showed up once in Ocean City at the Convention Center and did that. That, that really just foobarred the whole thing. I like the idea of let's put it back in the, in the voting room, and if that's a bank of computers, that's fine. I think we can do that process very simple. Mr. Chairman. Yes, sir. First Vice President. I, I, I think and Ben and I are sitting here discussing. I, th I think we're committed to resolving the process and trying to make it simple. You know, part of that is with utilizing Ben's idea with the 25 computers, you come in, that's where you're going to vote. So you come in, you do your registration, whether it's your department or your delegates, we'll, you, we'll know who, the, who those individuals are but the voting process will be there in an electronic format. Now, we'll take care by the 15th to get both Doyle and Rick together. We're committed to doing that, to make sure that that process is going to work before we go any further and get too far down the line um, going into Ocean City. So we have a little work to do and we're committed to do that, to make it very simple for folks to come in, register, vote, do it electronically, you're there. Not from your phone, not anywhere else. You have to come in, sign in, but the commitment also has to be from the departments, whether it's their president or chief, whoever sends in those names, that they're right, they're accurate, and that's not our fault, okay? So, and if you change something, Bring your letter from your president when you come to Ocean City to say, I'm making a change. It's as simple as that. So give us a little time to work on it. We, we're, we're hearing what you're saying, and you know we want to make the process easy. We don't want to make this any more difficult than it needs to be. And we'll look at simplifying the ballot. That, that, that's the next stage. I see your hand. Come on up. Dennis, state your name when you begin speaking, please. Good afternoon, Mr. President, officers and members. I'm, my name is Doug Ware. You can't hear me? Now we can. Okay. Uh, here we go. Uh, again, my name is Doug Ware. I'm the chair of the Constitution Bylaws Committee. And... Just wanted to give you an update. I was directly involved with this subject last summer at the convention. And I understand all the comments that have been made, and I can sympathize with those comments. I went through it. However, there's one part that you are not aware of, and I have all the copies from last year that all the voters had to go through. One significant part is that we had an authoritative parliamentarian. And that individual, his name was Michael L. Swift, who was registered professionally as a parliamentarian. He worked with us, with our parliamentarian, and our committee on setting up the procedures 
or we called the process for this election. And we used his authority and his experience giving us guidelines to make sure what we were doing was proper through the parliamentarian, which we're committed. And I have all the documents that he used for that process. And I was up on the stage that day talking to all the delegates, trying to explain to them the process. And it was short notice. There's no question. They weren't prepared for this. Many of us were not prepared for this, but we went through the process again during last year. We met at Easton, we met at other locations on that subject. And through that individual's guidance, this is what we came up with. And the only reason I'm mentioning that at this time is that Robbie and members here are talking about setting up procedures. Here we go. But you're not rethinking of the reasons we used that process last year. And I have copies. So if the committee or any members would like to make copies of what we used last year for guidance, I have them. I also have the uh, information regarding uh, Michael L. Swift, his phone number. If you want to use a professional parliamentarian to give you guidance on what should be the procedures, the process. So keep that in mind when you have your meetings, your special meetings, be aware if that's the direction you want to go. You want to use a professional parliamentarian or not. But just keep that in mind. I just want to make you all aware of it. I do have copies if you suggest your committee or task force, whatever you create <coughs> is here. And I just want to make you aware of it in, in the minutes. Thank you. Thank you. Any other comments? I've given time, given everybody the opportunity. I hear a lot of discussion out there. If you have a comment, bring it to us now so that we can take it in and we can make sure that we've heard everything. Last call. I want to thank everybody. That was a, uh, could have been a rather emotional or heated subject and we're going to continue. The presidents have committed that we're going to continue on the process. We're going to get resolution. Uh, we're going to have the deadline of January 15th. And executive committee, you can expect a special meeting right after January 15th. My other comment is, uh, Teresa came to me a couple weeks ago and her comment was, you know, we want to take this out, we want to do the town hall, and we want to make sure people were informed and the companies know what the issue is and what the solution can be. And at that time, she said the only company that offered to host a town hall was Branchville. And I'm, I'm scratching my head and pulling what little bit of hair I have. And I said, Bel Air will do one. And I really believe we should have more than just the two in-person town hall meetings. Because what we've talked about and people not knowing the facts, not having the information, is what we're going to run into if we don't get the message out. And we can say we can send it out by social media, we can say we send it out by email. They're not reading it. We can say we're gonna send it out paper-wise. They're not reading it. We've got to get the message out. Please, get with Teresa. If you're willing to host a town hall meeting, let her know. 
Any other, any last minute comments? Yes, ma'am. Teresa? When, when was it asked for volunteer companies or departments to host? Uh, you said I did ask for your firehouse because you have a big ball. And well, we have a training academy in Howard County, too, that I probably could have gotten. That has a large conference room. It, But I never, no, mean, I, as an I, I talked to somebody at your firehouse, not you, and they said that they're always booked. So um, I was going to actually try to do it a different way. And Well, I'll talk to you after everyone's about that yeah, because I, we I, have, I mean, each, I mean, there's many of us sitting around this table. So if all of us had been asked, we probably could have found different locations across the state. But I'll talk to you later about getting a location. Yeah, I, I did talk to um, Mount Airy because that was a big location for that aspect. But uh, Doug tried very hard to get the firehouse and their, their grounds that they have, and they were, they were both. They were so I was coming into the aspect that people are having fun Roadblocks, they didn't want to not help. It was just the timing was bad, too, for just functions that they had at their fire house. President Smothers. No, I was just going to say that the, the timing and locations we get at folks are having fundraisers and everything at, at their halls. You know, the intent was to have two in person and two online to keep people from traveling. But if we can get four in person locations, that's even better. So. We, uh, I can tell you, the three of us, we, we'll, we'll go wherever we need to go to, you know. So, Teresa, I want to say thank you for the work that you've done uh, and you continue to do. You've done what we've asked you to do, you know. And I, I'm going to say that, you know, if folks have an issue with what she's doing, that's what the three presidents, that's, that's us, you know. Don't take it out on her. She's only doing what we asked to do. So if you have an issue, come to Ben or I or Skip. You know, that's what we're here for, not her. She doesn't deserve that. So I'd ask you not to do it. So if you got an, if you got, if you got an issue about the process, then that's what you've elected us to do and take ownership of. So put the onus on us. So thank you. Final call, anything else? Thank you. Okay. Yeah. You want to do residential sprinklers while you're there? I can, yes, sir. Please. Thank you. Appreciate that. All right, sir. I'll resharpen the pencil here. Uh, residential sprinkler committee. I did submit a report, and um, I hope you all got it. It should be in there. A couple, a few little items with it. Number one, um, we did do more burn, more burns this year. I'm talking about year in total than we have been doing. Of course, that's due to COVID and everything else. Um, one of our trailers went to the Western Shore the 1st of August. I haven't seen it since. I will thank Chip Jewell. I, yeah. Uh, well, we know where it's at. I haven't seen it. But uh, Chip, thank you for your help. Uh, I've been looking for it. The uh, person that it was sent over there with hasn't contacted me back, won't answer phone calls, text messages, emails, or anything else. But anyhow, that's over the, that's over the water over the dam. Um, I did go to Delaware. I borrowed their trailer, brought it down. I did the 150th anniversary in Salisbury. Did a demonstration for them. I would say that of all the ones I've done, I've done quite a few of these demonstrations myself. It was very well attended. Good cross section of the community was there. We had some uh, city officials there. I don't know of any accounting, but anyhow. Uh, that trailer is back in Easton. I um, made arrangements now. We'll get that one rehabbed and get the one off the western shore back down to the eastern shore and get it rehabbed. So by the 1st of January, we should have both trailers back in operation ready to go again. That's going to be the first good thing. The next thing is I've been saying it for a, a right long period of time. We need to find another place to store these trailers. The building 
that they are stored in right now very graciously. Um, the county of Talbot has allowed us to store it in one of their buildings. That building's being torn down. They've been telling us this now for three years. I've been talking about it for three years. The end of next year, the first to 24, somewhere in that range, there will be no more building to store these in. Need to find some place here on the western shore to move these trailers. One of them, anyhow. Uh, the other one, uh, my plans are to take it back up to Delaware State Fire School. I spoke with the director of the fire school <coughs> about three weeks ago. He's trying to make arrangements. They're moving some stuff around. So anyhow, that's, that's still in the works. And, um, but that's where we are with this. People are still requesting them. Every time we take it out and show it, there are still people there that, including firefighters, I've got to say that, that don't understand why we have sprinklers and how they work and, and the difference they make. It's still a very valuable and valuable tool we have for educating the public. Even though we've got, we've got state laws, we've got building codes that require them, we still have people out here that don't understand them. So it's still a very viable and valuable piece of equipment that we've got. But that's where we are now. I, I know the location of both trailers. I have possession of one. I know where the other one is. I'm going to have it brought down, and we'll get those back in operation. That concludes my report, gentlemen and ladies. Any questions for Bobby? Dave, go ahead. I, I just want to add, uh, residential sprinklers, I don't have to convince this audience, is a very dear topic to us. We've been at this for, well, probably at least 20 years, if not more, you know. And I, and, and I can remember the days, Doug Alexander, he's still here, where we went county by county to get those, res, those, regu, those re, building regulations passed uh, to the point that we got 2008, a group of us went out to Minneapolis to have the International Residential Code changed. And even then, we had to come back county by county and beg for the adoption of that to the point that uh, I, I still remember that sitting down with Bill Bernard in, in 2011 when I became president of this association says, what do we do, Bill? We only got about half the counties. And we said, well, it's time to take the big bite out of the elephant. And that's when, that's when we changed the state, state code that says that you must adopt but may amend any provision of the International Residential Code, and we added the words except for paragraph blah, 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 but whatever the number is. And that was, that was in the 2012 legislation. Unfortunately, we had to give them a three-year, because they thought they were going to go back to the ICC and change the International Residential Code. So we gave them the 2015 to adopt, and, and, and unfortunately that didn't do. But uh, <coughs> many of you have probably seen the the newsletters that, that I've been putting out through the Maryland Fire Chiefs Safety Committee, uh, our November issue, which is now a month old, uh, talked about holiday safety. And I want to thank Fire Marshal Brian Geraci for writing our headline article, because it really talked about 2015 was a rough start for us. We knew we were going to face, face legislative pushback on now implementing what we passed in 2012. And then we had six people die in, in, in Indianapolis in, in a house fire. Uh, two adults and their four grandchildren so uh, you know please take this story because this kind of tells you this kind of gives it to us very clear the need for those residential sprinklers the need to water that Christmas tree because this started from a Christmas tree that they left for one more week because they wanted the grandchildren to be able to see that and unfortunately it was a tragic tragic ending to that story and, and as Brian tells in his story, I asked him to write the story, and, 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 and a very powerful story there, very powerful message. So we need to keep pushing. We need to give Bob, the committee, and, and every one of us need to continue to push, push for the residential sprinklers because we're not there yet. We still got counties that are refusing to adopt those provisions. And we got counties that are still coming into the legislation and trying to ask for an opt-out. They don't, they don't understand it. We do, and we need to educate them. Thank you. Looking at the agenda, uh, we still had for today, emergency medical services branch, gonna move that to tomorrow. Uh, we had training and safety branch, MSFA resource and management and information technology. Oh, excuse me. Uh, Fire prevention, not in information. Fire prevention and life safety. Is there anyone on 
those that need to absolutely go today. Was looking at uh, closing out about three o'clock to give everybody some time to um, relax, enjoy the Ocean City area, and be back tomorrow. Uh, the other point is looking at having lunch tomorrow around 11 because I, th I think we're going to be at that point. Anyone need to report today? To reach for a yeah. Okay. Well, I want Cindy up here too. Cindy. We'll do fire prevention and life safety. That's why I was asking to find out. <laughs> So the biggest thing that I will say for fire prevention is one, our displays back there. Have you seen it? I hope you have. Um, we did this message on pet safety, fire prevention, pet safety, fire and life safety. Um, do you know that poinsettias are the most dangerous to an animal? And that's the most toxic plant that the poison center for pets sees every year. I did not know that, so that's back there. I hope you all take an ornament. We made ornaments for you all. We'll ensure that you get them. Um, also, secondly, I have tree safety information from the fire marshal's office. Um, it was Arts and Crafts Day the other day, and um, we've had this for a while now, but we really want to ensure that if you're selling <coughs> these at your firehouses, please go online and print these out. We will make them for you if you need them. It's very important because I was going to say the same thing that Dave said. You know, on January 18th, a very devastating loss to this state will occur. And if you don't realize, the, um, the school, the Angel Schools fire happened on December 1st, which changed a lot of things in our fire service. Teresa, do you have it electronically? You can send that out. Oh, like, yes, okay. I do. Shoot it I even have it in JPEG so you can share it on your web pages. <laughs> That's what I want to do. I've Thank learned you. those things. That's what I want to do. A little holiday safety, a little colorful little table back there. You know, it's important. Got to take care of the pets. Um, so. The biggest thing that we'll be facing um, in, the next, in the next year that we're going to be working on as a committee is making sure that our departments understand the importance of community risk reduction. And it's not just on the fire safety level. It's all about all risk reductions, stopping every type of issue that we see as a state. So when we say community risk reduction, we're including health and wellness, we're including roadway safety, all those little avenues that we're losing our residents to, it's really important to understand. So we're working on that. So every year, as a grassroots effort, we've created um, Community Risk Reduction Week. Next year will be January, 20, uh, January 14th through the 21st, 2023. Uh, it started in January of 2021. And this year is going to be enforcement. Um, I was having a brain cramp the other day, and I'm like, hey, fire marshal, I think it's on engineering. He goes, uh, no, Teresa, it's enforcement. I'm like, no, it's uh, engineering. I'm like, well, today I had to correct myself. It's enforcement. So um, we will be creating some kind of messaging to help everybody understand enforcement uh, levels. Um, this is the community risk reduction program. The week was designed to help support our, the fire service, the fire and EMS service of the, of the countries, understand the importance of how these five things work, education, engineering, enforcement, economic incentives, and emergency response to help reduce the issues that we see at hand. I would like to put you all out of business. That's my goal. So um, another part that we've started with is called the CEF, which is a state commitment Statewide Collaboration and Engagement Framework. Uh, Maryland is part of the CEF. Um, it's been in existence for over 12 years, which we've been a part of this. And they've rebranded some of the programs and um, added some other um, departments in, or the states into it. Uh, the biggest thing is um, 
What they went to the next level was uh, engaging the fire service in a new way to educate second and third graders. So it's almost taking some of the learn not to burn program that was out there by the NFPA. And what they were able to do was collaborate with Young Minds Initiative. And it was based out of Michigan. And they worked with this company and they actually work with every second and third grader in the country. So they've given them this information. So myself, um, Beth Ann Neslett from Montgomery County and a school teacher from Baltimore City, who's a volunteer in, Upper, uh, in Montgomery County, and um, the Jewish School of Baltimore uh, in Rabbi, um, I can never say his last name. Um, Let's say it again. There you go. Um, he got me into those schools, and we've been doing fire prevention with them. And um, what's unique is um, the Jewish school really opened us up to another level that we've been able to meet with and giving that. So with uh, Beth Ann, she was able to take uh, Title I school in her county and they did a um, sweep of a um, trailer park in Upper, Mo uh, I guess Montgomery County somewhere. I'm not quite sure she told me the location. But um, they, were, they were only going to go to the school students. But once they got to the trailer park, they really realized that they needed to go back and do everybody. So they actually did every smoke alarm in the trailer park. And then they were able to put one in, in each of the children's rooms that they had. So that was a big impact. So that's what we're um, focusing on. And um, again, please, um, please, please, please take this stuff back there from the fire marshal's office. Uh, if you're going to sell the trees, this is something that you should be giving the people when they go and get their tree. It should be handed right with them as a tag. So um, we used to get tags from the DUI people and they had fire safety messages on the back, but they, that was a grant and that ran out. But um, I wish they would do that again because that gave a lot of information. But um, that's what we're doing. And then again, uh, we've already, in, we got the 2023 dates for our community risk reduction statewide smoke alarm initiative, May 20th through the 21st of 2023 and October 21st and the 22nd, 2023. And um, on a personal note, um, uh, Pepco, Delmarva, and Acceleron invited us all to Emmitsburg a couple of weeks ago. And I thought I was going because they were going to be or, um, honoring um, Gordon Wilkinson, who owns the cork bar, who had passed away because his father, well, Billy's dad worked for Delmarva for over 40 some odd years. And I'm like, well, I'm going for Billy. And I told the fire marshal, hey, hey, look, let, let's all go to this because I think it's pretty cool. And then Dean Hashmall said, oh, no, Brian's getting an invitation, too. I'm like, all right, that's cool. So we get up there and he's not telling us what's going on. But um, so just to give you all a backstory, um, and I know that I always talk about the cork bar, but there's special people there. But 20 um, some odd years ago, uh, Dean came to me and said, Teresa, I got this new guy I got to deal with. And um, his name's Pete. And um, we have been tasked by our parent company out of New Jersey because they're doing things to ensure that our residents are getting uh, the safety mechanisms that they need. I'm like, what do you want? And we were in Ocean City at the convention. I said, look, I have to go upstairs to a meeting for the artillery, but um, I, you know where I'll be that night. So um, Dean brings Pete to the cork bar. And we hashed out the smoke alarm program over a period of like an hour in the cork bar. And to be honest, I did not realize it's over 23 years that that program's been going on in the state of Maryland. And it all started uh, by me introducing my, well, he introduced me to Pete Peterson, I call him Pepco Pete, and um, realizing that the amount of smoke alarms that they've given to this state is in a, over 100,000 and um, giving it to the regions and to the Eastern Shore and um, all the different things. But y you would not think that just having a beer, talking about how to make a difference and um, knowing that that was going to happen. So then um, CB was really big for them getting smoke alarms in DC. So um, 
again, I'm thinking I'm there for Billy because Billy came and um, yeah, um, they gave us a brick. They gave us me, the fire marshal, um, Brady, um, Pete, um, um, Perringer, um, a whole bunch of us. They, they bought 52 bricks in Annapolis and um, I'm thinking, oh, this is really cool. We gotta take a picture for Gordon and give it to Martha. And lo and behold, our names are sitting on a brick. So um, I greatly appreciate that. I would never think that, you know, that would happen. But um, uh, my brick is next to CV. And then when we were doing the ceremony, the bells of the church started going off. And I was like, well, obviously he's frustrated. So <laughs> um, it, it's, it's, um, it's, again, I'm very thankful for that. But, you know, we all do this for a reason. You know, we're all crazy in a way. And um, having the ability to support the state that we have for um, trying to reduce um, the situations that we have out there, some I can fix, some I cannot fix. Some I'm shaking my head like, why? But ultimately, um, we all have an ability to make one simple conversation, and that simple conversation can lead to a greater outcome. So I ask that you all spread this information out as much as possible and help make a difference for Maryland. Thank you. Thank you, Teresa, and um, congratulations. It's well-deserved. Uh, you certainly have put your heart and soul into it, and it's nice that you're able to get something recognizing for what you do and a positive for your entire community rather than always have to sit here and hear all the negatives on the other committees we appoint you to. But uh, we thank you for that dedication and commitment. And yes, <coughs> the Christmas tree situation, for those of you that were involved in, in Annapolis, uh, it was just heart-wrenching. And that residential sprinklers, Maryland, continues to be a leader, and we still have political leaders in our state that are fighting us every single year. So it is a, it, we've won the war, but we have not won the battle. So thank you, Teresa. Cynthia. I will try, sorry, I will try to be very brief. Um, uh, congratulations to Teresa and everybody on, on that group. There's a lot that goes on 365 days a year. We, as Teresa says, there's a lot of information in the back. Um, one of the handouts that I did bring and did not attach, because I think we have done it every other time, and there's a similar one. Um, speaking of legislation, October 1st, the child safety seat law in Maryland was enhanced. Um, it was enhanced based on science to keep children rear facing till two. Um, that is a guideline. Um, it is the law, but if, if you read the whole law, law enforcement has some flexibility and parents should follow their child's physical structure and the recommendations of their car seat. We probably are fielding still about 100 calls a week between our office, state highway, and kids in safety seats. So I brought a clarification flyer. I am no longer a child passenger safety technician or instructor, but I do know the basics still. So I'm happy to field the questions I can and um, offline. I'll be here all day tomorrow and then also refer you to the folks that are experts on that. Um, my report is written. Um, we are already starting to work on a plan for convention. I believe I said at the August meeting, um, the Sunday through Tuesday afternoon has been wonderful for our team. We will be expanding that um, and hopefully working with, um, definitely working with Bill Hildebrandt, but hopefully in that same room to have an area for teens and tweens. Um, we've updated a number of documents. Um, it, as a nurse, it shouldn't be any surprise to anyone that the last three years I've been a little refocused. Um, we've done Safe Kids and Risk Watch, but there have been things we haven't updated. We have updated the calendar now. We've renovated that part of the website, and we will be building a new Safe Kids website over the next two months with Kelsey, who is our new graphic artist. Um, lots of other information that's in there but we also wanted to make sure that everybody receives a copy either today or tomorrow of the save the date for the public fire educator life safety conference it is saturday march 25th it will be at mifri 8 30 to 3 30. we are finalizing the agenda we hope to have the brochure out and registration opened before mifri goes on a holiday which will is usually the last two weeks in December, first two weeks in January. It may be a registration with a general agenda. We've got three great speakers who are coming on electric fires in all types of vehicles with two wheels and four wheels and no wheels. Um, we're hoping to have a great deal of hands-on outside and I can't thank Scott Wood and 
Tim Delahaney enough. Um, Teresa and I try to lead this group together and they are willing to do anything possible at MIFRI, including all kinds of tents. So I think it'll be a really good educational day. Um, and I can't think of anything else that is pressing at three o'clock in the afternoon unless Teresa can. No, um, the <laughs> other thing, just the last part for the ambassador program, um, we finalized the last part for the um, seniors. Um, I do know that it was a request of the presidents to add a uh, junior fire chiefs program. I am finalizing those rules. Um, so I, I would have to request permission from this group to add that program to us. I, I believe that's what I have to do. I had to do that when we did the juniors. So at this time, I would like to, to request that you all allow us to add a junior fire chiefs portion of to our ambassador program. Okay, Chair, accept the motion, Tim. Second and three. All in favor, signal saying aye. aye. Opposed, nay. Ayes have it. You got it. So once the rules are finished and completed, we'll send them yeah, out to you all so you see them and then you can share them. But um, our biggest thing is um, bringing the youth in as much as possible. Our ambassadors are great. I can't think of, we've had a lot of great kids be a part of this and move on. Um, just to let you know, our Miss Fire Prevention runner up last year, uh, she's applied to three local jurisdictions and she's doing really well. So um, she's still a volunteer in the state, but um, she's done her CPAT to a couple um, of Virginia locations and um, she'll be, um, good and then, you know you think about it we have one misfire prevention that's actually a fire protection engineer specialist so we've got a lot of good kids in these programs and they're working hard and just to let you all know uh, Lynn left but Sierra um, graduates this year uh, December and she will be graduating from um, uh, school in Rhode Island what is uh, New Haven Connecticut I'm sorry New Haven Connecticut and she's going to be graduating with a degree in fire investigations so our spark is lo low at this but we get a lot of good kids and they move on to great things so we we're doing we, we try to do as much as possible and the junior fire chief we just um, had two in Frederick County and I emceed the event and the one little guy it's non fire department they yeah. were they were from the community and he was just thrilled yeah. So excited to do it. It's, uh, actually, he's semi-fire department. His father's in charge of uh, Catoctin National Park. Yeah. So they're fire-oriented, but not yeah. in a, a local so fire th department. So that is, is a request that they have to be affiliated with a department somehow, some way, bringing that person into them so they're covered. But we just, um, sometimes our applications get out to the general public and they think it's like a beauty contest and it's not. Yeah. It's all about education and knowledge. It's more than knowledge. I mean, if you look at my questions, you all are like, where did you get those questions from? But I, I need them to understand there's a lot more than just doing one thing. You know, you got to know all the dynamics of fire prevention. So that's what we're doing. Great. Well, yeah. Any other questions for either Cindy or Teresa? I forgot one thing, and I'm sorry. I will get out to all of you when we get a date. We're going to do a four-hour medication safety training at the request of about half a dozen of the fire ambassadors who have said, I don't know enough to go out and teach this. Can we get a training? Poison Center will do it. I don't have a date. You'll have it when I have it. Sorry, Great. Jim. Thank you guys very much. Thank you. Mr. Chairman, back to you for all that part. Is there anyone else that needs to report today? Hearing done, Mr. President. There we go. Okay. Ladies and gentlemen, you heard our brief report that we had on um, the name change. As you know, I had requested to do not submit any changes till January 1. Now that we are working on the process of the voting by the 15th, I am requesting that if you can move that back to the at least January 20th after the fit you know that we have this program and in, in process and I'm also requesting if you are going to submit that you at least attend one of the town hall meetings either 
live or by Zoom um, to get the impact before we do. So that is the request I have, Mr. Chairman, on behalf of uh, the officers uh, to the membership. Anyone have any questions? I think the president made it rather clear. Uh, ben, while you're up, any closing remarks for today? Okay. Uh, number one, uh, Shal says that we can leave our uh, laptops and other paraphernalia here. We are, I want to thank Shal for the hospitality and uh, they'll have a continental breakfast tomorrow and a very light lunch uh, for us. So, uh, Mr. Chairman, that's all I have. I think we've had healthy discussions today. And uh, the whole goal is uh, us getting through this. Thank you. Again, I'd like to thank everyone for your patience, your cooperation, and the dialogue. I think it was healthy. And I'll call on a chaplain for a benediction. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you, Lord, for this day and all that we have accomplished. We pray that you will continue to bless this association and bless the members. We thank you, Lord, for so many people who are willing to give for others. We now ask that you would give us safe traveling to, to our places that we are staying and as well as tomorrow as we gather once again. Thank you, Lord, for your love and your mercy and all the things that you have done for us. Continue to bless the association, I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. We're recessed until 9 a.m. tomorrow morning. <laughs>